I click on the eMarket Trader tile where rates in 64 currencies are available. I pull up a quote. The rate still looks good. So I lock it in. All the details are captured in the blotter. It's my digital paper trail. When I need more detail, I expand my desktop view and customize how much information I see at a glance. Turning to other work, I minimize eMarket Trader to a corner of my screen. eMarket Trader offers everything in one clean interface. It's foreign exchange at my fingertips. Standard Bank, moving forward. Angela? Yes, mommy. What did you wish for? I want to be a pilot. I want you to fly, fly so high in the sky. And I... When shall we make our more realistic dreams? We don't kill dreams. We build on them. Because you're a star. Dreams come true. Dreams come true. Me and Mama, I thought our dreams would change. I don't want to disappoint my cousin and her. These little things we do today take us one step closer. Whether all you have is just a dream, we are ready to walk that journey with you until it's your reality. With us, you're one step closer to achieving your dream. Thun Big Bank, it can be. Oh, like a stress with a salary low. Enjoy up to 75 days on a repayment holiday. The arrangement fee, a loan turn of up to 84 months to amount of 250 million. Equities business, or call it a, a stock business, it's the, it's the dialect that changes. Uh, in some language, they call them shares, stocks, or equities, but they all mean the same. It is the unit of ownership of the company. You can invest in shares or own part of the company that is listed on the stock exchange by buying shares. These are already vetted companies. They perform very well. When you buy a share of a company, it means you become part of the owners of that company, meaning you are involved in any activities of the company, including decision making, deciding uh, board management. The, the general decisions of running that company, you become part of, part of them, and decisions are usually taken at the annual general meeting. How you benefit in buying stocks is dividends, which are the share of the profits into mm -hmm. a company. It's not a guarantee that there will be always dividends, but once the company makes profits, as a shareholder, you share into those profits. And the other common one is capital gains. Like any other business, when you buy low and sell high, we call it capital gains. But in, like any investor, once you look at a stock, buy it cheaply, and the price appreciates, you can sell it and make that margin. With the advent of technology and the markets going electronic, uh, we have what we call an SCD account. It's a security central depository account. So it sits at the exchange. It's a, it's a depository where shares get credited once you buy them. The requirement to open the SCD account we're talking about, there is a link on the Uganda Securities Exchange which you can share. You just tap on the link and all you need to be ready with is your national ID and taking a selfie. There are slots where you upload the back and forth of the national ID and upload your picture, which you can take using your phone. Meaning with your mobile phone, you can open an SCD account. Uh, an array of brokers will show up, but please choose SDG Securities, please broker 13. The account will be directed to us for authorization.
individuals can open accounts, corporates can open accounts, but you can as well choose to open as joint, all doable. And opening the SCB is totally free of charge. The account does not get stale. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, really good to see you this morning. We will be starting at nine on the dot. Um, so thank you for gracing us with your presence. If you've not had a snack yet, please feel free to get some breakfast. I'd like to encourage you, especially those at the back, to move a little bit closer to the front. There's still quite a bit of space. Uh, we're looking forward to engaging this morning. So thank you for coming. We'll be starting shortly. Thanks. My name is Sophia Chuck. I handle investor relations for Stanbic Uganda Holdings. I remember it was about a million shillings or actually it was 500,000 shillings. That was my very first investment. And that was in treasury bills, obviously, which seemed like a very simple one, short term, something I'm confident about that will come back after three months. Now, when I got used to the process of treasury bills, I ventured into bonds. Bonds are longer term, beyond one year. Now, the main attractive factor for me there was that interest came through by annually, twice a year, over and above the fact that at the maturity of this particular bond, you'd get back the amount you put in. When I did that the first time, it was very lucrative, and it was two years, every two, every six months, I would get two payments which was a good thing and it was exciting for me, extra payments outside my normal income. So I explored further into 10, into five years. I kept on over the years, I grew that up to 15 years. And uh, it has been really useful for me because it's nice to see extra income come to your account. We had a group of friends, myself and some of my colleagues and other friends outside uh, my workplace. We had what you'd call a circle. This month I get, next month you're getting, the three of us. So whenever it came to my turn and we collected that money, I would put it in the savings account. And I make sure I grew up to a point of say five or 10 million and I go and quickly put it in another bond. So at one point in time I had about 10 bonds running. And remember each time I have, Every six months, I'm getting interest. Now, nearly for, for a period of time, or I can't even remember the exact year, but every two months I had interest coming because each of these bonds were maturing at different times and paying interest at different times. The more you get used to investing or getting avenues of cash, you start now even thinking more, thinking more, thinking of more opportunities to grow your cash. And that's where I thought about uh, equities, investing in stock, uh, different companies. There are different IPOs that came up. I opted to invest in them. And the advantage is that you will have dividends coming from these different companies. What the investment family calls that is spreading your risk. If this particular investment doesn't work, I know I have the other one. If this one doesn't work, I know the other one is also coming. So for me, this has been a way by which I reduce my reliance on an income coming every month. The real intention is such that I can be sure that when I'm older and there's no more salary coming, I have income streams coming through. I have cash flows, not just from one thing, but one investment, but from various investments. The thing that we have these days in Uganda is that the investments opportunities are increasing. We have SBG Securities as an entity that offers those investments to you. It could be through investment in equity or treasury bonds, and there are various people whom you can invest through. But Stanbic presents you that through SBG Securities. I would say start now. You can imagine if you started at 25 when you just got your first job or 23, how much would you have built in terms of investments and extra cash beyond your income?
each one of us wants to leave a legacy for our children. We don't want it to happen as it was in the beginning where you have to take care of your parents or the, you also, when you get old, you also want people to take care of you. What about if we change that story and make it us leaving a legacy? for our children. And that for me is a very big driving force. Invest in different areas. Or we'll start with a bond, start with a bill. There are many people who can support you. SBG is willing to, uh, to support you. Standard Properties Limited, all those are there for you to explore. There is no simpler way to work with foreign exchange than e-market trader from Standard Bank. Example, my business has to pay an overseas supplier. Let me keep an eye on the rate. Hmm. Let's wait until it improves. There it is. I click on the e-market trader tile where rates in 64 currencies are available. I pull up a quote. The rate still looks good, so I lock it in. All the details are captured in the blotter. It's my digital paper trail. When I need more detail, I expand my desktop view and customize how much information I see at a glance. Turning to other work, I minimize eMarket Trader to a corner of my screen. eMarket Trader offers everything in one clean interface. It's foreign exchange at my fingertips. Standard Bank, moving forward. Angela, get for me. What did you wish for? I want to be a pilot. Want you to fly, fly so high. Fly. And I. When shall we make her have more realistic? We don't kill dreams. So we build on them. Because you're a star. Dreams come true. Dreams come true. Mama, I thought our dreams would change. I don't want to disappoint my cousin and her. These little things we do today take us one step closer. Whether all you have is just a dream, we are ready to walk that journey with you until it's your reality. With us, you're one step closer to achieving your dream. Thunbeek Bank, it can be. Oh, a stress with a salary loan. Enjoy up to 75 days on a repayment holiday. Your arrangement fees, a loan turn of up to 84 months to amounts of 250 million. Struggling to get capital to keep your business running smoothly? Umulaka stress with a business loan from Stanvik Bank. Get unsecured bridge financing of up to 500 million for schools and secured SME loans of up to 200 million and a loan tenure of up to six months with zero arrangement fees to meet your business needs. For details, call 0312-226-600. Terms and conditions apply. Sandvik Bank. It can be. All right, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed, good morning. And welcome to the Sandvik Bank Uganda Annual Macroeconomic Forum. My name is Philip Sully for the day. Um, ladies and gentlemen, today's theme is a new world order and its implications on business outlook. This morning, 
we have an action-packed couple of hours. Uh, we, in the room with us is a number of world-class economists. We have a star-studded panel of industry experts and sector experts. And we will use the next couple of hours to explore today's theme in detail. It is therefore with great pleasure, and I invite you to join me in welcoming our Head of Corporate and Investment Banking, Mr. Paul Moganwa, to officially open this event. Paul. Mr. Paul Moganwa is Head of Corporate Investment Banking at Stambik Bank Uganda Limited. Paul commenced his career at Standard Bank in 2007 as a graduate trainee and has risen through the ranks, having some in in South Africa and Uganda. He currently plays a critical role in formulating and articulating the strategic direction for the CIB business while aligning to the country's strategy. It's always a little weird listening to somebody else talk about you on a big screen. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to start with observing some protocol. Um, the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development, Engineer Irene Batebe. The Deputy Governor, Mr. Michael Atiego. The Executive Director, Supervision, Bank of Uganda, Dr. Tumubayene Tunemazi. Representatives from Bank of Uganda, the Capital Markets Authority, the Uganda Retirement Benefits Regulatory Authority, members of the Board of Directors of Stanbic Holdings and Stanbic Bank, our invited panelists, our esteemed partners, both in the room and online, all protocol observed, a very good morning to you all. Thank you for joining. I think we have about 150 people in the room and about a thousand online. We expect our online audience to peak at about 1,500. Um, and that excludes our esteemed partners that have joined us um, on TV, specifically NBS. I suspect the reason for this rather impressive attendance is less about um, bankers in shiny suits, but more about the topic that we've chosen today and the quality of the panelists that we have at our disposal. And I want to spend a few moments just talking about the topic. So last night, um, I was preparing for these introductory comments. Um, it occurred to me that actually, I thought I knew what a new world order means, but as I began to interrogate myself, it became clear that maybe my knowledge was not as robust as, as I thought it was. So, as most of us do, that have a, an electronic device and thumbs, we go to a fountain of knowledge known as Google. So I searched, I got three million hits on what a new world order means. Um, but after reading the first five, it became clear to me that Google was not my solution because there was a lot of contradiction. Some of the hits were talking about new world order being purely geopolitical. Some were talking about being purely economic. I was not left with a lot of confidence after reading those few entries. In my moment of panic, trying to establish exactly what new world order is, it occurred to me that actually Google is no longer the only fountain of wisdom. I'd heard about something new. I hadn't tried it yet, but I'd heard about quite a bit. And that's chat GBT. Um, for those of you that have not had the benefit of interacting with it, it's a chat tool that's based on open source artificial intelligence. And unlike Google, that simply search the entire internet and gives you a series of relevant feedback, ChatGBT actually processes information 
consolidates it into a short essay and presents it in a very curated manner. And, and that's the power of artificial intelligence. So this is what ChatGPT told me about a new world order. First, a new world order is a shift in the balance of power between nations and or regions. The catalysts for this shift fall into four broad categories. One is technology. The other is sustained economic shifts. The third is sustained change in political positions. And the fourth is war. So then I started processing mentally, uh, let's look at the state of the world. Does this criteria apply today? The first technology, I had a very easy answer to that. I'm using ChatGBT to establish what um, New World Order is. This probably was not possible a year ago. Um, and we can't underestimate the power of artificial intelligence and what it's going to do, the balance of power. It's not too clear who's in the lead today. Um, we hear a lot about what's happening in America, Silicon Valley specifically. Um, but we also hear that China potentially is at par or slightly ahead. There's also Russia. So it's not too clear who's in the lead, but whoever ends up in the lead is going to have a substantive impact on the global economy. The one thing that's clear from a technology perspective is that America is ahead when it comes to processing power, specifically chips. But that leadership position is not necessarily guaranteed in the medium term. That's one criteria. Second criteria, which is economic, um, we have seen unprecedented, at least in the recent past, shifts in uh, macroeconomics. One that is very recent is sustained inflation across the globe, um, particularly in Europe. Uh, which, you know, in, in a recent past, and I think for most of our adult lives, we have not experienced. But the second is the sustained growth in China. Uh, and yes, it's come off a little bit in the recent past, but still, the trajectory is undeniable. China is going to be the biggest economy in the world. So another tick on economics. The third criteria, politics. Um, Pre-COVID, there was a nationalism agenda that was consistent in the developed world, um, propagated by Trump, but also seen in parts of Europe. post COVID, it's reduced a little bit, but by no means has that momentum completely disappeared. Um, and I think um, the next round of American elections will be very telling, uh, but I suspect that nationalism is here to stay in the near future. Politics tick, then war. This is a no-brainer. Um, we have not seen two large powers um, interface in context of war in the recent past. What we are seeing between Ukraine and Russia is really a war between two different deep economic philosophies, the war between NATO and Russia. Um, and the last time we saw anything like this was the Second World War. So. Off the top of my head, looking at the criteria that ChatGBT has highlighted, it does seem like we are the precipice of a significant shift in power. But ChatGBT's description did not end there. It went on to say that it's very hard to tell when the shift is happening, whether it's happening or not. You can only tell retrospectively. So it qualified its response by saying, this criteria can only really be tested after the events have happened and materialized. So excited by the insight that ChatGDP was giving me, I decided let me expand my start a little bit. And I included the terms, what are the implications for Uganda? And it started off with a, two paragraphs where it highlighted Uganda's location. Uganda is a beautiful tourist attraction. Um, it's uh, considered to have potential to become the food basket for East Africa. Um, it's on the precipice of um, oil and gas production. Um, 
I was a little disappointed because I had asked it very specifically, what are the implications um, of a new world order in Uganda? And the first paragraph sounded like a tourism brochure. Um, so my, my faith in chat GBT had slowly started to diminish. But as I read on, the, the response from chat GBT pivoted a little bit. And it talked about Uganda being a very interesting country that over the long run, defined as 20 years, it seems to have sustained decent GDP growth between 5 and 7 percent. It seems to have weathered many storms quite well. And how they defined weathering storms is our monetary policy was sound. Um, standard of living has continued to improve. Poverty has continued to go down. And this is in spite of the 2008 financial crisis, um, in spite of COVID and all other global events. So ChatGPT's economy is quite robust. Um, and that robustness is facilitated by three things. The fact that we're self-sufficient on food, we have a relatively diverse economy, and we have decent FDI flows for the size of the economy and the opportunity presented. So, ChatGPT once again qualified its response and said it's very hard to establish exactly what the impact on Uganda would be of a new world order. And we need to engage a wider set of experts to establish what that impact can be. Fortunately, today, ladies and gentlemen, we have those experts at our disposal. We've selected panelists that not only have to deal with this data on a daily basis and process it, synthesize it, uh, to the point that it becomes intuitive. But more importantly, they have to make decisions based on this economic data and these perspectives on the global economy. Decisions in context of monetary policy for Bank of Uganda, decisions in context of attracting FDI for the Ministry of Energy, decisions in context of day-to-day -day business, some of our business-oriented panelists. So I think we have a set of credible individuals to engage. I encourage you to listen in, to participate. I believe there is uh, a Q&A for those of us in the room, and there'll be some functionality online. Please do take advantage. I close by thanking you once again for joining us. We do not take your attention for granted. It is very difficult to win over attention in this time of many distractions. So the fact that you're with us is not taken for granted. And hopefully we'll make it worth your while. With those few words, thank you and have an excellent morning. Thank you, Paul. A big round of applause for Mr. Muganda. Uh, I'll take that. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, Paul, why is the feedback? Paul sort of broke down um, what the New World Order means from a geopolitical perspective, a technological perspective. And if you have 1,000 people online and almost 200 people in the room, that's the power of technology in its own right. Um, but to just sort of zone us into this morning's focus around the economy, uh, please join me with a round of applause to invite Mr. Gibran Qureshi, uh, Standard Bank's economist, um, to give a Mr. Jibran Kirishi is currently the Standard Bank Group's head, Africa Region's Economic Research. Jibran provides strategic and operational leadership to a team that has members in multiple geographical locations across the continent. His team's research is aimed at identifying potentially profitable trading opportunities in the growing African euro bond market. Jibran advises the bank's clients and senior management in various in country offices on Africa strategy. Additionally, he has advised governments and central banks on ad hoc research and advisory requests. He was ranked first by the Financial Mail Top Analyst Awards for Sub-Saharan Africa in 2016, and his team also emerged victorious in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange Spire Awards in 2016 and 2017 as the best Africa research team. 
morning, everyone. Um, and, and thanks, Paul. Um, thanks, Flip. And of course, uh, all protocols observed. Great to see uh, policymakers, uh, Dr. Michael Tingi Ego, who I last interacted with on the sidelines at the IMF meetings in October. So it's good to see you now in your hometown in Kampala. Um, and look, it's great to be here today. It's, it's been nearly three years since we, um, you know, we've done this in-person economic forum. I think it had become quite customary for Tanbic Bank Uganda to have these economic forums in January or February, kick off the year. And I guess, you know, we never thought a few years back that this would be possible. And it's great to see uh, this kind of interaction. Now, I'm going to speak for about, uh, I'm going to try 40 to 45 minutes. Um, a caveat there that, you know, we may slightly overrun, but I'm very, very conscious that I'm speaking before the deputy governor who's going to come and speak after me, um, which is always a, a difficult task for an analyst or a researcher to do speaking just before a policymaker. Um, so I hope everything goes well. Um, I understand that the slides are going to be um, controlled remotely, or is there going to be a ticker? I believe there'll be a ticker. Um, but yes, I mean, it's, you know, I think mostly what would happen uh, in the last one or two years is we would um, start every presentation by speaking about COVID-19. And, and I think it's, we are in, in an environment where we have now thankfully transitioned away from the pandemic phase towards the sort of endemic phase. And all those stringent public health restrictions that we had are behind us. And I normally say that if you look around the room in some of the conferences and presentations that I speak at, you know, nobody's wearing a mask. So that's the easiest sign for me to uh, draw home my point that we've moved away from the pandemic towards an endemic phase. In fact, you know, if you think about it, in, in my own scenario, when I first got COVID uh, in, uh, in 2020, and you know, I, I had flowers being sent to me, I had uh, people sending me chocolates, I had you know, nice WhatsApp forwards being sent to me, uh, the second time I got it, there were a few less chocolates and flowers and, and you know, well wishes. But when I got it for the third time this year, um, a few months back, all, I got calls asking me if there's anything wrong with me. Like, is there something wrong with you? Because you seem to be getting it and no one else seems to be getting it. So that was a clear suggestion to me that this should be now treated like a flu. And if anyone even gets it, you know, we just keep quiet about it. You sneeze and, you know, you clear your throat and you stay at home for three or four days. But it's great to see that we are now in that phase of, um, of, of life. But, of course, what I want to do today in this presentation is I want to speak about our views on the global economy very briefly to understand how we in Uganda and how we in Africa fit into, into that sphere. And... You know, as you've seen with various OECD forecasts, IMF and World Bank forecasts, uh, it is very likely that global growth will be relatively subdued, subdued in 2023. Um, and of course, we think this slowdown in growth will not be necessarily synchronized. So we think that the contraction or reduction in output will be more severe in the Eurozone and will also be more noticeably slow in the UK. But of course, in the United States, we think there could be a less severe contraction or not going to be a more pronounced slowdown in growth as what we're going to see in the UK and the Eurozone. We do think that that's because of a few factors. One, uh, the US is a lot more self-sufficient when it comes to power, when it comes to oil, and of course, all the fiscal stimulus savings that the U.S. citizens were provided in 2020 have still kept their pockets relatively deeper. If you look at the United Kingdom, the European Union, of course, that side of the world is a lot more reliant on gas supply from the Russian side of things. And, you know, we do believe that it's going to be a terribly and awfully difficult European winter for those parts of the world. Of course, China does present some hope in 2023. 
specifically with their end of the zero COVID policy. Uh, we believe that there will be an improvement in economic output there as restrictions pertaining to COVID-19 are, um, are uh, lowered or you know, become a lot more uh, um, lenient. Now, we have to understand a few things when we talk about the global economy. Um, if I had a sort of penny for every time I was asked whether Africa will also contract because the global economy may contract, and speaking about some numbers, global growth could be as low as 1.7% of GDP this year, um, from you know as high as about 3% of GDP last year. Africa might be between 3 and 3.5%. And um, but of course, the monster of inflation that central bankers domestically and abroad that have been trying to tackle, it's probably one of the main factors why we are gonna see a noticeable recession in the Western world. As you can see from this exhibit ahead of you, the US labor market is very, very tight. And in the last 40 years or so, Western central bankers have had to contend with demand-driven inflationary pressures. But for the first time in nearly 40 years, they've had to now contend with services inflation. We are seeing wage pressure that we haven't seen in a long time, and that is what is effectively reducing profitability for many firms in the Western world, and effectively what is also you know, resulting in this slowdown in growth. Now, services inflation, when it's driven by wage pressures, is a lot more long-lasting, it's a lot more insidious for central bankers to deal with. And for that reason, while we do acknowledge that arithmetically we will see a decline in inflation in the US, the UK in 2023, we do also pose the question out there that could inflation now be more of a structural problem for the globe rather than a cyclical problem? And what I mean by that is statistically as base effects and wine, very likely that we see lower inflation this year in the Western world that may prompt some central banks in the Western world to stop hiking rates. But is inflation now a structural problem because of deglobalization that we're seeing, aging demographics, the rich world, you know, a lack of investment in hydrocarbons because of a more conscious approach towards ESG? All these factors do you know, somewhat suggest that inflation, apologies about that, inflation might now be more of a bigger monster than a lot of us think. And at Standard Bank Research, we actually have this vision that Western central banks may actually, over the year, next year or two, increase the inflation target from 2%, slightly higher, close to 35 4%. And that is a very, very strong possibility because with the current 2% average in, uh, inflation target that most Western central banks have. We and many other analysts believe that it'll be probably three years or so before we start to see inflation at that 2% level. Now, of course, a lot of the monetary policy tightening that we've seen from advanced economy central banks like the Fed, like the ECB and the Bank of England is being done so to induce or provoke a recession. And that is their mechanism to try and counter these rising inflationary pressures that we've seen. For what it's worth, we still think that the Fed, the US Federal Reserve that is, will hike rates to 5.5% this year. The market is a bit less hawkish than us in terms of what's been priced in. I think the market believes that the Fed will only hike rates to 5%. We are slightly more hawkish in that front. We think 5.5% this year. And we do believe at some point this year, the Fed will stop hiking rates, potentially from the second half of 2023. And again, in contrast to the market, while the market believes that the Fed could cut rates as early as the end of this year, we at Standard Bank Research believe the Fed will start cutting rates in early 2024. So that's the Fed pivot that everybody is talking about. But the important thing is not, a, when the Fed pivots, but it's when the Fed signals that they're going to pivot. And we think that signal that they're going to pivot will come around June, July, which I think will be 
a welcome development for emerging market risk assets and portfolio flows back into our side of the world. Now, what we've shown you in this exhibit is the last 50 years or so in global growth, and we've highlighted in green periods where there was economic distress or global recession. Of course, more uh, prominent in our minds or fresh in our minds is the recession of 2020 because of the pandemic, once in a lifetime contraction, if you may. Then, of course, the global financial crisis of 08 or 09. And, of course, in the early 90s, there was also the Gulf War. Now, what we think uh, will happen in 2023 will probably be the slowest growth barring the 08 or 09 recession, the 2020 pandemic. So it will be the third slowest global growth rate uh, in the last 15 years uh, in, um, in the world. Now, of course, does Africa follow this trend? If you look at this chart, the red line definitely does suggest some element of correlation. But remember, Nigeria and South Africa account for 50% or so of output for uh, SSA. 50%, the very, two very large economies. If we were to exclude SSA and include Egypt, it would be even larger. But Nigeria and South Africa are both very commodity dependent. And of course, in previous crises, as, as we can see from this cycle, a global recession tends to be accompanied or tends to coincide with falling commodity prices. Now, at Standard Bank Research, we believe in 2023, oil prices may not fall as much as many people would think. Of course, a global recession, slower growth in industrial nations will reduce demand for oil. And yes, initially that could bring down international oil prices. But we have to bear in mind that the US government has openly come out and said that they are going to replenish the reserves if oil prices fall to as low as $70 per barrel. So from the outset, we already know that that is a flow for international oil prices. Secondly, as I've already mentioned, the world's second largest economy, China, will come back with, the, with more zeal in terms of demand following the reopening. And this surge in pent-up demand, we believe, will keep not just oil prices higher, but also copper prices potentially higher. And of course, not to mention that we are seeing a stubbornly uh, tight supply stance from OPEC plus. Confluence of all these factors, according to us, will keep the oil price outlook more bullish this year, probably even rise back to as high as 1995, uh, compared to perhaps what many other people are pricing in at this stage. The other question that we ought to think about and answer is if global growth was to slow, what does that mean for tourism? That's the first point that we think about when we think about Africa and slower growth. And again, you know, there is a strong link between tourism earnings or tourism arrivals and global GDP, as you can see from this slide or exhibit. But what is different now is that we think the era of revenge spending post-2020 is not over. In fact, according to the United Nations, United Nations World Tourism Organization, about 900 million tourists traveled internationally last year. And that is still only 60% of pre-pandemic levels. It's very likely that we still have massive potential to see an increase in tourism earnings, despite what we are going to see with regards or with respect to a slowdown in Europe and the US. And what I find quite fascinating, as you can see from here, there's definitely been a noticeable spike after the pandemic, but still way below pre-pandemic levels of 2018, 2019. What has been happening is we are seeing, or we could potentially this year, see a decline in tourism arrivals. But if you look at central bankers, if you look at governments, when they work out the balance of payments and the current accounts, they have tourism earnings in service receipts. Because, I mean, I'm sure all of you can relate, you know, traveling today has become crazily expensive. And your average cost of travel now uh, is probably 40 to 50% higher of what it was in 2019. 
And despite the risk now that if people's pockets in the Western world are not deep enough to come to our side of the world to travel and spend, whoever comes will be spending significantly more than what they were spending uh, three or four years ago. So let's distinguish between tourism arrivals and tourism earnings. So tourism earnings will likely be much higher than tourism arrivals. Um, the other thing that you know, probably helps us sleep better at night is the fact that many of the key markets in the tourism sector um, or key tourism economies that we look at, and we look at Botswana, the Okavanga Delta, Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, of course, the beautiful beaches in Accra, Masai Mara, and the beautiful beaches in, Nairo in, in Kenya, Mauritius, Tanzania, and of course, Uganda as well. Nearly 80% of tourism source markets or tourism arrivals into Uganda come from within Africa. And similarly, in other markets, of course, Kenya has a bigger reliance on North America or Europe, but still about 34% of Kenya's arrivals, tourism arrivals, emanate from within Africa. And Uganda's is a massive or whopping 80%. So that, in a way, will also help the resilience of our tourism sector, contrary to perhaps what many other people um, would, like to, would like to think. I'm actually struggling to move this uh, ticker because, all right, fine, it's back. And again, just, I don't want to disappoint, but because we get asked this question quite a bit, and this is slightly technical, but I'll try and simplify it. There are two ways to look at gross domestic products. The first one is called the income, which is a sectoral approach, uh, or the production approach. And the second one is GDP by expenditure. The easiest way we can um, you know, defend our view that Africa will not holistically decline because global growth is going to decline is by looking at two aspects of GDP by expenditure. The first one is private consumption expenditure, and the second one is net exports. Private consumption expenditure is a good reflection of domestic demand. Net exports is a good reflection of how much you rely on external demand. As you can see from this exhibit, the likes of Angola, the likes of Nigeria, quite reliant on external demand because of their reliant on, reliance on exports of oil. But other markets like Uganda, other markets like Kenya, private consumption expenditure accounts for over 60% of output. So we're still very reliant on domestic demand, which again will help underpin our resilience. So for instance, if there's a prolonged drought, 2023 from last year, that could be more severe for many African markets that we cover um, compared to what would have otherwise been the case. Now, moving on towards Uganda, of course, I think with Uganda, there's, there's been a lot of excitement around oil investment. There's been a lot of discussion of what oil will mean for the Ugandan economy. And how I want to start this discussion is we want to start speaking about our growth est estimations or forecasts. I want to take a bit of an extensive 360 view on debt, especially in light of what we're seeing in Ghana and also now more recently in Kenya. And then towards the end, we are going to summarize some of our macroeconomic variable forecasts for all of you. From a growth perspective, we think this year, which and we look at it from a fiscal year, so we're looking at FY22-23, and then we look at FY23-24 that begins in July. For FY22-23, you know, we're expecting growth close to 6%. Um, you know, and we, when we think about more medium-term growth starting from next year, we think growth could, could rise to as high as 6.5%. But a lot of this is contingent on the weather improving. As you know, we've seen one of the worst droughts in East Africa last year. The short rain season uh, in other neighboring countries in East Africa hasn't been as robust. But I do understand the rains have come in quite good in Uganda. So if the agrarian sector to rebound, I think that would definitely be um, positive for underlying activity. 
I'm sorry, I think this is not very clear, but you know, I hope all of you can, can hear me properly. Um, and, and is there any chance I can get a different mic uh, if this one's gonna be breaking? Perhaps you can just try a different mic. Um, and in addition to that, I think there's obviously been an, uh, a view around oil investments as well. Now, one thing I like, which we'll discuss when we, when we get to debt, there's not much uh, pricing in or present valuing of oil by Ugandan authorities or Ugandan policymakers, which I think is quite disciplined and very prudent. But if you think about the post FID environment as we approach first oil, um, the investment spending that is likely to ensue will certainly be positive for economic output. And of course, a lot of this will now depend on the financing of the oil infrastructure. And if the financing of the oil infrastructure takes off um, commencing this year, specifically for the crude oil pipeline, we do think that the government then comes into pole position for first oil between 2025 and 2026. But when we do the math, when we, when we work out the likely investment spending, look at it by the lens of FDI, some of these numbers suggest to us that for an economy the size of Uganda, that kind of investment spending does have the ability to help this economy grow above 6% in the medium term. And we're quite confident about that. But of course, there's a big question mark on whether we are going to see financing for the pipeline take off fully this year. But I do believe that this year is the year. If we want to see first oil in 2025 and 2026, this is the year that we need to get the financing secured, signed, and sealed. Now, for what it's worth, um, you know, my my views on, on on ESG is really important for the world. But I think, you know, a lot of a lot of African economies, a lot of emerging markets that have you know, relatively weak GDP per capita need to be given time. They have to be given time. They have to be allowed to develop some of these hydrocarbon potentials that they have in order to alleviate poverty, in order, in order to overcome hurdles of industrialization. And this is something that the Western world did in the 70s or 60s. And I think to come out and, and tell African countries or emerging market countries that you can't do this now is quite difficult. And having said that as well, I think they should be accorded time. They should be given time to meet their climate goals. And a project that has the ability to create thousands and thousands of jobs should, should be allowed to kick off. Now, on the current accounts, um, the balance of payment side, as you know, oil prices that were significantly higher last year, bloated imports, and of course that widened the trade balance. But you know, we've also seen a bit of a, a bit of a slippage in exports. I mean, yes, service exports have been picking up because of tourism, as I mentioned. But you know, Uganda, the trade balance at least had become quite um, quite shiny, for the lack of a better word, because of very robust, um, you know, gold exports, which of course, because of the tax policy a year back, we saw that kind of plateaued. And we're starting to see that come back somewhat, uh, but of course it's not come back in the big way that we saw uh, pre-2021 or pre-2022. We think the current account deficit this year will remain wide at 9.3% of GDP. Uh, we think last year the current account deficit was at about 8.8% of GDP. But I think the main question is not about the current account deficit, but rather it's about the capital and financial account now. And I have to say that last year was, was quite scary because what we've seen in the last decade, many African markets have boosted their, or fund, funded their current account deficits by external borrowings. This is the syndicated loans, the euro bonds, the like, and foreign portfolio investment. And last year, we saw foreign portfolio investment dried up uh, because of the Fed tightening rates. It was incredibly expensive to issue syndicated loans or even issue euro bonds. So the balancing factor from the capital and financial account 
was not there and that's why we saw a significant decline in FX reserves and the external accounts, many African markets that we cover, and Uganda was not any different. Now, of course, speaking about gold, I think for the trade balance, this will be important for gold to come back. Um, you know, unrefined gold still attracts a tax, so maybe that's still a problem. But of course, there has been some reform and we've started to see a slight pickup in the monthly export numbers that the Bank of Uganda publishes. But I'm still never sure whether this money passes through the local FX interbank market or it doesn't. And why I think this is important is that if you are doing north of a billion dollars in gold exports, and if, if none of that passing through the local FX interbank market, then you're not going to really see a problem if those, those gold exports um, decline. Because if it's being, you know, uh, the dollar receivables are being secured in a bank offshore, for example, like many, I guess, mining companies would do, then that necessarily wouldn't be something that would keep me awake at night. But if half of these numbers are being converted locally, the FX interbank market, then of course, if you are going to see such a sharp decline as you can see from this chart in gold exports, um, then of course, naturally, that would be a bit more concerning uh, with regards to FX liquidity. Now, Again, export destinations um, in a world where global growth is likely to flow. And as you can see from this exhibit, Uganda still heavily trades within the African continent. I mean, between Kenya and the DRC, you're looking at close to 30% of export destination. Of course, South Sudan and Rwanda has declined over the years. But, you know, if you included those two markets, then it was closer to 40% as well. Um, but of course, there's, there's no need to celebrate a global recession. But of course, what we're trying to point out here is that there will be more resilience than perhaps more, many of us think. Speaking about the exchange rates, now just going back to 2020, dollar UGX obviously um, rose quite significantly, like many other currencies across the world during the pandemic. And then of course, in 2021, we saw that decline because we saw a notable increase in portfolio inflows. And of course, uh, if you look at last year as well, we saw portfolio outflows where foreigners who were holding um, government bonds were exiting the market because of the parabolic strength in the dollar. Dollar index rose to the highs we've not seen in 40 years because the Fed was hiking rates and interest rates in the Western world were rising. But what, we, what we've started to see is that the Uganda chilling is becoming very correlated with global risk sentiment. And what we mean by that is that if the Fed hikes rates, or if the Fed um, suggests that they're going to hike rates, Uganda is becoming a high beta market. We call it a high beta market in financial market terminology. It will react more than other markets that don't have uh, such high beta, like Kenya is not as high beta, Tanzania is low beta, uh, Mozambique is low beta. And I think what we are starting to see positively, but uh, three weeks back, Standard Bank Research posted a large fixed income investor roadshow into Uganda. And we are starting to see a lot more interest in Uganda. And the reason for that is from all the investable markets, bond markets that our clients like, which is you know, typically being Uganda, Egypt, Kenya, Nigeria, and Ghana. Uganda is the only investable market right now. Uganda is the only market that hasn't had FX liquidity challenges last year. Everyone else that I've mentioned, the markets are you know, not investable or as investable. So I was telling someone earlier this morning that when the tide does turn, one of the first beneficiaries of portfolio inflows or capital reversal into emerging markets in Africa will be Uganda. And we're already seeing a lot of investors come into the stock market. That basically, think of it as a transit point, like a transit lounge. They're all sitting in the transit lounge, waiting to pounce when they can. Um, and I guess from a currency outlook perspective, you know, I'll, I'll give you my focus at the end. But I do believe that as we approach the dividend repatriation season, there'll be a bit of modest upside dollar UGX pressure slightly, because we'll get back to about 3,700 or thereabouts. 
Um, but what we're starting to see is that uh, the coffee exporters in Uganda tend to hedge much earlier. So they start selling dollars much earlier. And they would typically use a spike in dollar UGX or episodes where dollar UGX spikes to start selling forward. So back in the day, you know, 2014, 15, 16, coffee exporters would sell into the market or hedge around October, November. But now we're starting to see them do this between April and June. So if you start to see a bit more stability um, from that avenue, because they're going to be using this spike in dollar UGX that could be driven by dividend repatriations to start hedging their positions or hedging their requirements. Um, I do believe that once we see that initial spike for the factors that I've mentioned, I do believe that the Uganda shilling, there will be a bias for this currency to not just remain stable, but also appreciate into the second half of the year. So year on year, Standard Bank Research, we're actually forecasting uh, the dollar UGX to be below 36.30 by the end of the year. And we actually think that um, this will be driven potentially or primarily by the portfolio reversals that we're expecting. Now, on the Monetary Policy Committee front, of course, we are going to be hearing from uh, the DG very soon. And, you know, he could come here and contradict me completely. Uh, that's the risk that I'm facing. But uh, at, in my team, we are expecting the Bank of Uganda's MPC cut rates this year. Uh, by the end of the year, we, we think they will be in a position to cut rates because our view is that inflation will cool off, not just because of what we're seeing globally, but also because of base effects. And of course, it will help if the food supply situation also improves. Remember, we are starting to see a significant improvement in supplier delivery times. Remember the supply chain dislocations that we saw um, in the last two years? Sandvik Bank Uganda's PMI, which is closely followed by the Bank of Uganda and many other policymakers, is already showing us that supplier delivery times are reducing. And of course, this could be a function of the uh, decline in demand globally. Of course, freight costs have come down. We're starting to see freight charges, cargo charges reduce. They're not at the highs we saw them in 2021. They're slightly lower, but this could be a function of weakening demand not necessarily improving supply. So if demand globally was to improve in the second half of this year or the first half of 2024, these supplier delivery uh, or supply chain issues could very, very likely um, become, be, begin to become a problem again for inflation. So the inflation outlook will be pivotal and central to the central bank in our view. We think post June, it's very likely that they could be a, an accommodative tilt. Um, over the course of this year, we have penciled in at least 150 to 200 bips a decline. The risk to that view is if the Fed will be more hawkish for longer, if portfolio investors will take longer to come back to this market, and if that could put the UGX on more pressure than we currently envisage. So if these risks transpire, then we think the Bank of Uganda will be a lot more cautious than we have currently anticipated. Now, as, we, as a wind down, I just want to speak about debt. And I think it's important to understand the genesis of the problem. And we focus on today, we focus on yesterday, but the issue with debt has all to do with weak savings. And this is the total investment as a percentage of GDP uh, charted against total savings as a percentage of GDP for Uganda over the last 23 years. And as you can see, there was definitely a bit of a pickup in savings as a percentage of GDP from 2000. But ever since 2008, nine savings have actually plateaued. But at the same time, investment appetite, largely because of the urge, or at least the desire to industrialize and invest in infrastructure, we've seen our investment needs across Africa, not just in Uganda as well. So unfortunately, we are in a position now where because we still have weak savings, Across the continent, we have to attract foreign capital to finance our infrastructure ambitions, for example, or development ambitions. And post 08 or 09, it was great because quantitative easing meant that there was monetary largesse, there was cheaper financing for the syndicated loans, 
commercial euro bonds. But now we're living in an era where we're starting to rethink whether this is going to be as cheap as it is going forward. Now, debt to GDP, you know, I normally come to Uganda and, you know, I recently did a presentation at, at the World Bank conference across, I think it was a room upstairs over here a few months back. And I, I find like, you know, there's obviously a concern about debt and there's nothing wrong to be concerned about debt. But, you know, when you look at your debt to GDP compared to other countries like, you know, Kenya, or we could throw in Zambia and Ghana, then you'll be less concerned. But it doesn't mean that public debt or the trajectory of public debt is, is not worrying. And that's what Uganda needs to think about. You know, is Uganda 10 years where, where Kenya or Ghana was 10 years ago? You know, so if you look at debt to GDP and you say, oh, well, it's below 40%, these guys are at 60%, they're at 70%, we're fine. That's one way to look at it, but it's also a concerning way to look at it. Because these countries that have fallen down the debt trap that are now restructuring debt like Ghana were at these levels a few years back as well. But they had this insatiable appetite for commercial debt, and they obviously had this massive infrastructure spending needs as well. This exhibit is quite important because it shows you debt service metrics as a percentage of exports, as a percentage of tax revenue. For me, I'm not an engineer, and I'm an economist, very difficult to quantify the productivity of a infrastructure project, be it a road rehabilitation of an airport or a railway. But the easiest way to look at whether an investment is productive is to look at whether you've accumulated all this debt. Did we see an increase in exports as a percentage of GDP, tax revenue as a percentage of GDP? And if that didn't happen, then you have to go back to the drawing board and ask yourself whether this infrastructure you're spending on is the right infrastructure, whether it's being financed at relatively cheaper rates than other markets are doing it, and whether it's benefiting the private sector that should subsequently then have an increase in tax revenue or an increase in export earnings. That is really, really important. And I honestly feel that many countries in Africa have got this wrong, very many countries. I blame the Africa rising narrative 12 years ago where everyone was told, or everyone thought, the takeaway from that conference in Maputo in 2010 was we all have to spend on infrastructure. And that's what everyone seemed to have done, financing it from foreign capital, not looking to boost domestic savings, not thinking about how that infrastructure is being financed. And we moved away from concessional lending, and we started getting this insatiable appetite for commercial debt. And I show you this graph here, or table, I've highlighted Uganda, at the bottom just before Zambia. But if you look at markets now like Angola, you look at Zambia, you look at Kenya, one thing you notice is that in the last decade, from 2011-12, the composition of their commercial debt as a function of their total exter external debt has risen quite exponentially. Kenya only had 6% of commercial debt as a function of overall debt, 2011-12. Today, it's just below 30%. Ghana, a country that is officially defaulted a few months back, back in 2011-12, commercial creditors accounted for 10.5% of the debt stock externally. Ten years later, just prior to the default, is 51.1%. Angola as well, just got a debt write-off from bilateral creditors, China specifically, a few years back. Similar scenario. You know, we see very, very elevated commercial debt as a function of external debt, nearly 80%. Now, Uganda, about a decade ago, barely had any um, commercial debt. In fact, you had no commercial debt after the HIPIC debt relief. But now you look at that ratio, it's at about, um, it's, it's, it's increased slightly, I think, to about 8.8%. Not at concerning level. And in fact, I have to say, that we have been urging the authorities in Uganda in the last 10 years to issue more commercial debt like Eurobonds, but they've actually said they wouldn't because they don't know where to spend it or they don't know how that absorption will look like. And I normally say this, that's actually a feather in the cap. You know, when the music was loud, when the music was loud and the party was booming and buzzing, when every other African country was taking Eurobonds, 
Uganda and you know we were in the meetings with the investors who would come and they would beg the authorities across the road at the Ministry of Finance to issue these euro bonds and they would say thank you very much but no thank you we we don't know where to spend this we are watching how other countries are going to fare with this when they could have said yes give it to us and we'll find a way to spend it but to us you know that that's something that you know from the from the, from inside you might critical but from from outside at least from my experience or lens of barometer having looked at other markets there's been some element of at least uh, public finance uh, external debt management that hasn't been as bad you know as as many of us think but of course when you look at the fiscal policy um, I, I get a bit concerned about this because I feel like Uganda pays very high real yields and you know with Dr. Tingi Ego when when I normally have the uh, for, fortune or chance to moderate sessions with him uh, when when we meet I normally ask him this do you think that Uganda pays very high real yields and I feel it is true I think at some point Uganda has to realize that it's not all about the carry trade not all about portfolio investors but at some point you have to think about private investment and for that to happen you have to start seeing more fiscal discipline with regards to expenditure and an improvement in mobilization of revenue I don't think Uganda can pay these kind of real yields for too long because you know if we see something go wrong in the global world again you know, at some point Uganda's and actually Uganda's problem I think is not on the external debt front it's the domestic debt front that's where the cost of debt is a bit too expensive but again how do you reduce that you have to tame or curb your appetite for spending this is the issue that we generally have yes the government has forecasted a lower budget deficit for FY um, 23 24 or even FY 22 23 for that matter but you know every every year close to May June there is normally 11th hour spending that not only disrupts fixed income market and all of us that are in the in the bond duration trade will start making losses but it basically creates a credibility deficit sub budget private placements you know, 11th hour just before the end of the fiscal year these are things that you know would have to reduce would actually have to reduce and unfortunately you know I, I kind of feel that you know there's too much focus on revenue mobilization and I, I don't think there's anything wrong in that but I, f I feel like there has to be more prioritization on which development projects we're putting through the IMF sadly at times would say oh, the IMF would never be proponents of scaling back development expenditure they would say no no keep development expenditure is good for growth but to restore debt sustainability to lower your budget deficit improve investor sentiment at times I kind of respectfully disagree with them and you know we can postpone some projects rather than do all of them at once speaking of that you know as you've seen with the IMF reports it is very very evident that the uh, multilateral agency would like to see the Ugandan government improve their development absorption um, this is something that is quite pivotal but of course I'd even while we're on the topic I'd even say this that many countries that didn't restructure debt or default last year was because they had the IMF programs on their side so it's critical that the Ugandan government does everything they can to meet those qualitative or quantitative benchmarks under the program of course as you know as the IMF has, has, has mentioned in the staff report as well um, the government needs to be more disciplined clear the central bank overdraft and you know if if this is something that is not done let me say religiously or sincerely going forward it is definitely could definitely be a bit of a risk to the program reviews and disbursement under that program the billion dollar program not about the money more around the sentiment that that program brings as an anchor for investors you know for any reason if an investor was to hear that the IMF has has stopped a disbursement or Uganda has failed the review you know that could be terrible for market sentiment so I think that's very very um, critical point now 
as I end on my last slide, you know, we will share this presentation with you. But, you know, you can see some of our forecasts for dollar UGX for the Bank of Uganda's um, CP, CBR. Inflation as well, you know, we think it falls to 5.7% in second quarter and then to as low as sub 3% the fourth quarter of 2023. Um, but, of course, we live in a very, very uncertain world. And I remember speaking to risk people in our, in our team, in our bank in 2020, and they would say, could this happen? Can that happen? And I'd be like, never, it'll never happen. And now when they ask me, can this happen? Can that happen? I say, you know what? Anything can happen. After 2020, after the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, after the once in a lifetime pandemic, uh, Brexit, you know, uh, as, as was mentioned before, I think by Paul, more uh, more nationalist policies, protectionist policies globally, anything can happen. So the risk outlook is quite important, and that's why we've provided a bearish scenario. A bearish scenario basically means that if we're wrong in our baseline assumption, this is what's likely to transpire in the in the alternate scenario. And of course, the bearish scenario for growth would mean that the drought would be more severe, the rains will be poor. Um, in the bearish scenario as well, we are factoring in a delay in oil investment uh, financing, and that could, you know, reduce potential output as well. Um, and of course, that could make the Bank of Uganda me a lot more hawkish. Now, as I end, let me just say two things. I think we have to have a reset, massive reset across Africa. What we saw last year at some point globally, we thought this is it. The music is slowing down and it's never gonna come back on. And we thought that everyone is gonna fall down this trap. But we're getting some light at the end of the tunnel. The music is starting again. The risk environment may become conducive for external issuance. And some African governments can refinance debt, can issue syndicated loans, euro bonds and the like. But if inflation is a structural problem and not a cyclical problem, it's a matter of when, not if, when Western central banks will hike again in the next three years, four years, five years, six years. If African governments by then have not re-navigated the public finance management world or thinking around commercial versus concessional debt, improving public investment efficiency in infrastructure, increasing domestic savings, improving uh, revenue mobilization, then you know what? there'll be a lot more Ghanas down the road, sadly. Um, and speaking about Ghana, if the Fed didn't hike as viciously or aggressively as last year, would Ghana have defaulted? I ask myself that question a lot. Probably not last year, but they would have eventually restructured. So we have to have a reset around debt. 2022 should be a wake-up call for everyone. And I think we have to have a reset around agriculture. Let's now start thinking about development in terms of not a road or a railway or an airport. Let's think about development as sending uh, funding to small-scale farmers for seeds. Let's think about sending funding to them for fertilizer. Let's think about how a new agriculture policy altogether. I think if you get agriculture right, it's a cheat code in many parts of Africa to support productivity, support um, growth ultimately, and boost growth potential. That's my time. Thank you very much, and I'm grateful for, for all of you listening. Thank you very much. It's always thought provoking to listen to Gibran. I'm sure we've got a number of questions, um, both in the room and online. We'll have a chance to do that. Instead, as we just follow through with around what does policy look like, what's the cheat code to ensure that African economies and Uganda specifically are resilient as we move forward, please join me with a loud round of applause to invite the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Uganda, Dr. Michael Atingi Ego. Thank you.
much. Dr. Michael Atingi Ego is the Deputy Governor, Bank of Uganda. He is an accomplished economic policy maker, having spent more than 35 years in both regional and global financial institutions, such as IMF, MEFMI, in addition to his earlier years in Bank of Uganda. Through his leadership positions and research work, he has been at the forefront of capacity building, strengthening monetary policy frameworks, and modernizing macroeconomic data, statistics, culture across Africa regions. Thank you very much. And um, all protocol is observed. A good morning to all of you. Gibran, thank you so much for your presentation. You have given the global and the domestic economic outlook. You've talked a lot about the numbers and everything. Broadly, I think you touched on the key messages, but we can have a conversation on the details because normally the devil is in the details. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to build on what Paul mentioned earlier on about the new world order. He identified, if I recall well, I recall three key areas that he talked about, economic, technology, and war. But I'm not here to talk about war. I'm going to talk about economic and technology. So when I talk about the new world order and its implications for business, let's first of all try to understand what is the old world order. Because to, for you to understand the new world order, you need to understand what the old world order is. And I would want to link this to what we call the Washington Consensus, where you had the globalization and the free movement of um, trade, capital, innovation, and people generally. What happened was that there was a registered increased collaboration across the world. There was increased global trade, and this actually did propagate uh, private enterprises across the borders. You see the multinational companies begin to earn huge profits because they were able to offshore some of their services to areas with cheap labor. They were able to access financing at cheap costs. And therefore, uh, we see the shareholders value grow due to increased profitability driven by cost optimization via offshoring, low cost financing, and favorable tax regimes in the name of attracting investors. Inflation also was low and stable. But this picture began to change in 2008 when we saw the global financial crisis and then the recession that Gibran earlier on mentioned. The world tended to become more interventionist with a number of states beginning to impose regulatory regimes in the, the financial markets corporate behavior, and the growing sentiment and action against the free movement, capital, goods, and labor. Then you begin to see trade wars uh, take place, challenging the multinational cooperation business models and economic policy. Now, I see that that was not enough. We begin to see several shocks play into, the, you know, into this. Uh, the, take, for example, the Brexit shock that Gibran mentioned earlier on. And I think also Paul talked about it. This restored the complexity in the European cross-border trade. Then we also, uh, we are aware of the COVID-19 pandemic that disrupted the supply chains and exposed the weaknesses, the health systems. And of course, without mentioning the obvious, the Russia-Ukraine war which of course stopped and spiked the global inflation, distorting the financial conditions around the world and derailing economic activity. And then there's another big elephant in the room, the climate change, which is posing existential risks to humanity. And we have the acceleration of the IT revolution, the technology that Paul mentioned on, with a faster digitalization that offers opportunities but at the same time, poses serious risks, cybersecurity, among others. So as a result of this, we are seeing global trade and investments having to adjust now heightened uncertainty 
in the global financial markets with a potential persistence of light to quality, especially in the looming public debt crisis in several African countries that Gibran mentioned earlier on. And then there's the whole aspect of simplification and diversification uh, of supply chains with reshoring, onshoring, nearshoring. Take, for example, Hubu in Uganda. You talk about the ESC, you talk about commerce, I talk about the African colonial free trade area. All this is changing from the global value chains that we used to have, from the offshore that we used to have, to now onshoring, nearshoring, and what have you. But this is coming at a cost because they are not delivering these, uh, these services at a lower cost, which the global value chains had actually initially delivered. These are now coming at a, at a much higher cost compared because they are not necessarily the cheapest. So this means that we have to contend with a fairly cost-push inflation as a result of the changing in the shoring, and this becomes a challenge for the central bank. Now, of course, what do governments do? Governments are going to, to seek resilience of supply chains uh, through diversification, industrial policy, and promoting social safety nets. And of course, government will struggle to raise revenues in this kind of situation. And then the whole animal called debt. Um, when Gibran was talking about debt, I was listening very carefully. And let me tell you, Uganda right now is at a moderate risk of debt distress. I want you to compare this to 15% of the low-income countries that are already distressed. And look at this also in the context of 45% of the low-income countries which are at high risk of debt distress. So, why is Uganda at moderate risk of debt distress? It's not because some of the solvency indicators like debt GDP have gone beyond the thresholds. It is just because if you subject some of these variables to some extreme shocks, then you lead to a But I will not dwell on that because I'm here to talk about policy and operations in the context of the new world order. So what then is Bank of Uganda going to do in this new world order? I think Bank of Uganda is going to remain focused on fostering um, monetary and financial stability. We are going to harness the digitalization that Paul talked about, largely to to achieve the objective of uh, financial inclusion. And while we talk about financial inclusion, I want to emphasize the point that Gibran mentioned towards the end of his presentation. We need to grow the domestic economy through involving small scale holders. And I'll come uh, to, to, you know, to that later on. So I'm also going to talk about how do we then live in the world, uh, changing world order particularly in the context of climate change. So, and how does this affect the framework for which we are using to supervise financial institutions? I will briefly now talk about what are the specific interventions and policy considerations for Bank of Uganda. First and foremost, there has got to be policy flexibility amidst frequent exogenous shocks. If you are not gonna have flexibility in policy, amidst all the shocks that are hitting us, we are not going to survive this tight. This is exactly what we have been doing right from the time COVID-19 hit. We moved from a situation where we were injecting liquidity into the system in order to support the, uh, the resustenance of growth following the reduced aggregate demand. And because of the Russia-Ukraine crisis that hit us in February 2022, we had to shift gears that the liquidity that was injected was going to be a risk in terms of talking inflation if we did not remove that liquidity very, very fast. So it means that policy flexibility amidst external shocks is going to become 
very, very frequent. So that means you have to be innovative in the way you, uh, you formulate monetary policy. In your operations, you have to be innovative. And we on record really to have brought in, um, uh, we have nuanced, we have tweaked the way that we operationalize policy to suit the changing environment, to suit the environment characterized by the various shocks that we're facing. And that's why today, notwithstanding the fact that inflation has gone, has risen world over, we have managed at least to pick it at around 10 points, uh, you know, in the early 10 points, uh, one to about 10.3. That's where we think is peaking. And going forward, we see it coming down to single digits. But this involves tweaking the way we conduct monetary policy. And then, of course, um, there are a number of issues that we have had to contend with that Jabrin talked about. The issues of portfolio flow reversal and how you handle that amidst a situation where your reserves are coming down. It's true that our reserves have come down from the highs of nearly $4.6 billion to what we have right now, $3.6 billion. And what in the past led to the decline in reserves? We tried to smooth out the volatility in the exchange rate when the currency was depreciating fast in May. And also we've seen the debt service increase. We've seen government imports also increase. But we have played our role as a central bank. We have minimized our interventions in the foreign exchange market, particularly on the sell side. And we have been still able to realize stability in the exchange rate, notwithstanding the fact that we have not been selling foreign currency in the market. And this has come about because of tweaking again monetary policy to ensure that the exchange rate remains stable. Now, the aspect of this service, there's little that you can do about it. You have to honor your debt obligations. And we're trying to see how government can also reduce its imports so that we are able to, to uh, continue buying um, FX. And by the way, notwithstanding these challenges, Bank of Uganda resumed buying uh, FX from the market the month of uh, uh, December and January. We have been buying foreign currency. Um, in this era, we, we've seen a stable exchange rate. That came about because of the way we treat our monetary policy to stabilize the exchange rate and uh, ensure that the inflows that we were getting, creating uh, stability in FX, enabled us to resume buying forex. So this would be done while maintaining uh, price stability. Now, of course, also, the other issue that we have to contend with are the spillover effects of the interest rate hikes, the escalation of the geopolitical risks, and um, we also need to look at how we can then accommodate all this. But remember that these spillovers cannot be eliminated because Uganda's financial and trade uh, interconnectivity um, dictates that we have to live with them. So for us to be resilient, Uganda must therefore develop and deepen domestic financial markets to minimize the impact of rising debt service and this issue of portfolio flows that come in and go out and therefore destabilize our exchange rate. So how do we do that? We can do that by supporting, first of all, increased production domestically and then adding value to what we are producing to our natural resources. And when we do that, we are able to, one, increase our exports value added of our natural resources, increase exports, and also maybe substitute some of the imports uh, for the local production. And that leads to improvements in your external balances. So this is what we're trying to do, particularly in ensuring the value chain financing of the key, uh, the key sectors uh, takes place. So, let me come to the aspect of, um, and maybe let me just emphasize one point here. As a central bank, we are committed to delivering our policy mandate in a fair or a foul weather. 
and Bank of Uganda will respond flexibly and unexpected shocks. And we will, of course, unwind any unorthodox policy measures and interventions that we have used in this innovative approach when normalcy sustained and restored. Let me talk a bit about the digitalization. Uh, we all know what the pandemic did, increase the digitalization, and we are now harnessing that to promote our electronic payments and deliver of financial services. Now, technological advances, ranging from ATMs, mobile banking, and the latest biometrics have proved to be the key enablers in the financial industry. But of course, while this is offering a technological competitive advantage, uh, and which is integral to our business models and operations, we also run the risk of cybersecurity. So that means that um, these guys are increasing in their sophistication and frequency, and given the uh, growing access to internet and availability of hacking tools, this is something that we have to contend with going forward. So therefore, rather than restraining technology because it presents these risks, all the stakeholders should build safeguards to protect financial institutions, preserve clients' interests, and enhance public confidence. And I want to hasten that the extent of interconnectedness and proliferation of access points compel all the players in this ecosystem to work as a team and develop minimum standards and security standards because, like the saying goes, the chain is only as strong as it is weakest link. So we are implementing the national payment system to advance this, and we are cautiously considering the adoption of emerging technologies in our operations, such as the blockchain that may potentially improve the efficiency of transactions, as has been demonstrated in some countries like South Africa under the project or pro, uh, COCA. And then also we're taking lessons from our pioneers and the Bank of Uganda is researching and exploring the uses of blockchain technology, machine learning, and other forms of artificial intelligence uh, within the bank and the financial sector. Now, the benefits of course that come with the digitalization um, include the support for big data to help in the refinement of uh, policy formulation for price and financial sector stability. So Bank of Uganda started this journey and it's expected to replace the traditional ways of collecting for data, which relies on surveys and they, uh, they come with a lag and therefore the effectiveness and the efficacy of policy is constrained by these long lags. So we are now at the nascent stages of working together with other financial sector regulators and other private sector players to discuss how blockchain technology can be uh, appreciated and introduced to our financial sector. We're also studying uh, the implementation of central bank digital currencies, and uh, we are putting in place a technical committee to work on this, and it will produce a strategic and a comprehensive policy paper to guide the Bank of Grand Development's the implementation. Now, I'm not going to talk about cryptocurrencies because we, have, we still have some reservations on this, uh, given what we are seeing about these currencies or assets. You know, the recent collapses of the FTX and the Terra Luna in August 2022 has crystallized the risks and the ruined cryptocurrencies posed for consumers. So I will not talk about that. But importantly, Bank of Uganda is open to financial innovations especially those that would reduce transaction costs and enhance financial inclusion. So, um, and we have a regulatory sandbox that can be used for testing some of these innovations under a control environment. So in terms of institutionalizing this technology, this is what we're doing because this is now where the world is going and we cannot stay away from it. Now, let me briefly touch on climate change. You know, as a central bank, we recognize that climate change and other environmental risks have a material impact on financial and macroeconomic stability. Climate change comes the poor more than the rich, particularly for countries like Uganda, because 70% of our population 
He is in the rural areas. He is engaged in agriculture. This agriculture is rain-fed. When you have changes in climate, it is the poor that are badly hurt. And if you, you also look at their consumption basket, a bigger percentage of their consumption goes on food. So whenever you have um, a drought, food prices tend to go up. And just imagine somebody who's spending a bigger proportion of their income on food, and they're poor. They are really, really badly hurt. So as a central bank, we are very concerned about this. Now, um, as a result, we have been backed on accounting for climate and environmental risks in the monetary policy and financial stability frameworks by including some initiatives in our strategic plan for 2022 to 2027. So we are going to institutionalize environmental, social, and governance, that is ESG standards, across all our operations and in the banking sector. Now, in terms of fostering price stability, the Bank of Uganda monetary policy frameworks will identify some of the economic shocks uh, that affect us, their nature, their persistence, and their magnitude. It also assess the impact on the potential outputs and the output gap and the inflationary pressures that will help us then in formulating monetary policy. Now, of course, climate change increases the frequency and the severity of the adverse supply shocks, the destruction of capital stocks and labor supply and supply chains. And also it makes the demand shocks uh, acute by damaging household and business uh, balance sheets. So, in addition to the national reliance on agricultural exports, it means that our balance of payments can be affected and it has serious implications for the exchange rate as well. So that's how critical climate change in the conduct of Bank of Uganda operations are. Monetary policy, external um, sector, but also it has implications on supervised financial institutions. In conducting risk-based supervision, Bank of Uganda is going to identify the material risks that are facing supervised financial institutions as a result of climate change. For example, climate and environmental risks heighten the risk profile of the financial system via capital requirements for absorbing climate-related risks. In addition, of course, climate-related risks uh, can induce credit risks direct or indirect exposure, and the deterioration in the borrower's ability to pay. So it is important that in our stress testing of the balance sheets of commercial banks, we introduce the aspects of climate change. So accordingly, the Bank of Uganda is introducing a climate change risk policy, guide the integration of um, climate change risks, delivering the central bank's policy mandate. So we'll be accounting for climate change risks, in our micro and macro prudential uh, work. Now also we're institutionalizing uh, the ESG and the ESG focus on the fact that unless you can have environmental and social sustainability, financial institutions cannot have financial sustainability. You are only as strong as your environment and the society that you work in. We have made an initial start with the bankers, and we're making progress in that area. There are challenges, but we are moving into that because we want to see how the commercial banks and other financial institutions are going to move away from creating value for the shareholders, creating value for the societies that they operate in. And you can only do that by lifting these guys who are engaged in agriculture, the small-scale enterprises who are in the value chain financing in order to make them socially sustainable, environmentally sustainable, so that you can sustain your profits going forward. Right now, the oil sector, once it takes off, particularly production, you are going to see a lot of lending by commercial banks to the oil sector. But we are concerned that the oil sector is a carbon emitting sector. So we will be asked having a conversation with the commercial banks. Now that you have lent an oil to a carbon emitting sector, 
what are you doing about absorbing the carbon emissions that you are financing in increasing emission? We'll see how your balance sheet uh, is considering uh, reducing carbon emissions. So that's a, this is a discussion that we're going to be having with them. So let me conclude by noting that a series of shocks are hitting Uganda, hitting the region and global economies, and has stressed the importance of building resilience in order to survive and thrive. Therefore, all the stakeholders must do their part to ensure that institutions, enterprises, and economies build capacity to tackle these shocks, get up, and keep going. This is the new world order we're talking about. The setbacks will come no matter how strong or res uh, um, resistant we are, and they are likely to impact us. But like the impact of vaccination against viruses, resilience allows us to keep getting up and again after being knocked down and we have to keep going forward. So on our part, Bank of Uganda commits to bring whatever it takes within our means and mandate to ensure price stability, financial uh, sector stability, and of course the effective payment system in a foul or a fair weather in good and reasonable time. And to do that, we will be very flexible and innovative. The challenges as they evolve, be they from geopolitics, natural causes, or the unknown unknowns. We may innovate for versatile policy frameworks to respond flexibly to unexpected shocks by, develop, by deploying unorthodox tools in wartime, like we've been in a war, um, economic war as a result of the Russia-Ukraine thing, so we have had to deploy unorthodox tools. Still, we commit to restoring the traditional and predictable, even comfortable toolkits in peace time. And finally, as a central bank in a developing country, we are using our strategic plan to contribute to social transformation, not least through promotion of the financial inclusion of the vulnerable at the bottom of the economic pyramid by institutionalizing ESG sustainability frameworks across the regulated institutions to ensure that finance is a wave that will lift us all in the boat that we're in, come and in stormy waters. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael. May I please ask for a larger round of applause? Um, we've had a lot of posit positive comments this morning. Quite comforting when the regulator and the deputy governor say that um, your forecasts, Gibran, are quite close to what they think. So kudos, it's quite comforting. We've had a lot in terms of policy flexibility and kudos to the central bank. We are deemed a very investable and attractive market, among other things. Monetary financial fiscal stability, digitization, domestic market growth, a lot of policy intervention coming through there. Now, as we prepare to transition into the panel discussion and uh, Deputy Governor, I'm not take to invite a horde on your tables. If I could please ask that you scan that cord and just give us some feedback as to how you're feeling um, about this right now. If you're online and there's quite a, there's over 600 people online at any one moment in time, there's a link in the chat. Uh, please click that and give us some feedback. As we transit into the next part of this discussion, where we have a panel of experts um, from the energy sector, from manufacturing, from academia, to sort of break down and further explore a number of the things that have been highlighted, um, it's my pleasure, and I'd like you to, to uh, I'd like you to join me to invite Mr. Alan Mohinda, 
the head of global markets um, at Stanbic, Uganda. Very good morning uh, once again to uh, you ladies and gentlemen, both physically here and online. Um, I would like now to take this opportunity to welcome our panelists this morning. And to start, off, start us off, we have uh, Ms. Irene Batebe, who is the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Energy. Let's once again welcome the Deputy Governor, Mr. Michael Atingi Ego. Then we have Ms. Joselyn Kateba, who is the Managing Director of Crestform, Uganda Limited. Then we have Dr. Fred Mohumuza. At Ms. Jocelyn Kateva is the Managing Director of Crest Form Limited and serves as Director on the Boards of the Uganda Export Promotion Board and Uganda Manufacturers Association. Prior to Crest Form, Jocelyn worked for nearly four years with global power company Cummins and four years at global strategy consulting firm Bain & Company. She has international experience having worked in South Africa and the USA in different leadership positions. Jocelyn holds an MBA from the Harvard Business School, USA, and a Bachelor of Science degree in Maths, Operational Research, Statistics and Economics from the University of Warwick, UK. All right, and then we have uh, Gibran Qureshi. Once again, welcome. So before I take my seat, uh, just to, to let uh, the panelists know, with the exception of Joseline, who is a, a Harvard graduate, we have a lot of mix here between Manchester and Liverpool alumni. Uh, I think that should make for a good combination. I think I see the signal from uh, the Deputy Governor. And then, of course, we have Gibran from uh, London School of Economics. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the quality of the panel that you have before us. So, let's jump into it very quickly. So to, to get us underway, I thought I would share with you some very, they are not unique, but maybe they are, you know, they are not readily found if you don't read a lot. The Deputy Governor spoke about globalization. Today, our annual trade from a globalization perspective is $29 trillion. That is a number that if we see the things that are being spoken about is at risk if they happen. The other number I wanted to share with you is on global financing condition. For the last 20 years, about 25, 26 trillion has been injected into the global financial system by different central banks. In fact, at one point, there was just about 13, 14 trillion of that in negative interest rates. That's the world that we're coming from. In the same period, of course, debt has been uh, extensively spoken about. Debt has more than doubled across the world, two to three times of GDP. In Africa, foreign debt has risen to as much as 790 billion. And I know, Deputy Governor, you're very passionate about these numbers. Maybe you'll speak to them at some point. Climate, a 0 0.8 degrees change over the last decade. Now, you might wonder what that might mean. 
at a 0 0.8 degrees change in 10 years means that you can get drought twice as much in 10 years, whereas previously you get it once. You will get torrential rains that is 25 to 40% more than usual. You can imagine how destructive that is. Very connected to uh, climate, ESG. In some quarters, the preference is to call it good for the people, good for the planet. If you take away something from ESG, that should be it. It's projected that we will have about 50 trillion worth of investments from different fund managers going into ESG investment. Those are numbers I'm hoping will anchor some of the discussions we'll have, but then you can also take away and start to reflect on them. So to kick us off, I am going to turn to the PS, Ms. Irene Rateve. Oil and gas has been extremely topical. Gibran started with oil and gas as the anchor for our growth. But many businesses out there are anxious. When does the money flow? If you could help us and walk us through the steps up to the first point and where we are right now, I think many people will walk away from here uh, knowing exactly where we sit. Thank you very much, Alan, and uh, good morning, uh, all the attendants, all protocol observed. Yes, uh, that is a very interesting question. And before I can get into the status of the oil and gas sector in Uganda, it's important that I speak to the new world order and how our oil and gas sector relates to that. Since time immemorial, the oil and gas sector has faced a number of disruptions in terms of supply, but also price volatility. At, at, in about 2014, we were enjoying very high prices at about $100 per barrel. And then during COVID, we dipped to negative $37 per barrel. And while we were recovering from COVID, a unique situation comes into play in terms of the geopolitics, but also the protectionism as part of the trade policy globally. So today, the oil and gas sector is faced with a trilemma. We have to deal with issues of our energy security. How do we ensure that we are able to meet our energy needs? But also we are dealing with aspects of supply disruption, but also diversification uh, arising from the Russia-Ukraine war. We are seeing many countries looking to other sources uh, for their oil and gas products, uh, given the sanctions that are on Russia. But equally, the issues of ESG and low carbon economy, but uh, aspects of climate change are also coming into play. And that is shaping the oil and gas sector in Uganda. But one thing that the oil and gas sector has demonstrated as we go through these changes is that it is resilient. Uh, the oil and gas sector in Uganda has been resilient. Uh, we've been able to take our final investment decision, which was taken last year uh, for the upstream, but also for the East Africa crude oil pipeline at a time when the world economies were recovering from COVID. So that speaks to a number of aspects that the government, together with its partners, have ensured to enable the robustness of the industry. Uh, we have created a favorable investment climate, thanks to Bank of Uganda and Minister of Finance and the rest. But also, in our policy, we've ensured that we are bringing on board uh, the right companies that were able to sail through the difficult times. So through our policy of competitive licensing, we've attracted reputable companies that have invested in the country. So that speaks to the outlook of the oil and gas sector in Uganda as one that will stand the test of time. And I want to uh, come, Jabrin, that we are still on course uh, for our first oil come 20, 
25. And at some opportune time, I'll speak to the financing for the East Africa crude oil pipeline, because we are equally moving on that. So in terms of status, uh, we have witnessed uh, in, the, in the past few days the commencement of drilling our major areas, development area, and we are equally preparing uh, for the spudding or commencement of drilling for Tilenga that equally hosts uh, a significant portion of our crude oil. So in terms of where we are and the milestones going forward, we are at a point where we are done largely with all the technical assessments for the projects. The financial viability for the projects have been determined. The projects both for the upstream, the East Africa crude oil pipeline, and the refinery have proven to be robust when it comes to their viability. And at an opportune time, I'll also speak to the oil refinery. So as part of our commercialization plan, we are commercializing 6.4 billion barrels of standard tank oil initially in place. That is all the oil that we have in the ground. But due to geological factors, we are only able to recover about 1.4 billion barrels. So that is the quantity that we are commercializing through the crude oil pipeline, but also the oil refinery. So the way the projects are structured, the crude oil pipeline together with the upstream are advanced in their development and uh, they are the two projects we've undertaken the final investment decision and the refinery is following in tow. So following the commencement of drilling, uh, we are continuing with a number of aspects. Uh, when it comes to the upstream, uh, we are at a point where we are preparing the site or what we call the industrial area that will accommodate the central processing facilities for processing the crude oil before it is transported to a terminal, uh, before it, it, it continues to its destination, either to Tanga or to the refinery. So with that, we are also undertaking a number of procurements because there are quite a number of contracts that we are issuing out and uh, we have tiered them. Uh, we do have tier one contracts that are largely going out for the engineering, procurement, construction and management, where we have the major EPCs. And uh, from the tier one, we will also have the tier two and tier three. And later on, when we discuss national content, we'll see how we are participating along those tiers. So as we undertake the procurement, we are doing this in tandem. It's not a straight line. So we equally are undertaking some construction works. As we speak, the construction works for the terminal for the crude oil pipeline in Tanga is already ahead, and uh, we are preparing to commence the construction on the Tanzanian side of this pipeline. So in terms of the next milestones, we really see that for the next two years, we will be hitting peak in terms of construction, are preparing for production in 2025. And uh, I did see Jabrin indicating first oil 2026, but our target remains 2025, and uh, we are still on course for that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Vatebe. So Jabrin, there you have it. But if I may bring it closer to home, what I'm hearing from you is between now and 2024, this is when the money is flowing. Is that right? Precisely, yes. And uh, why do we say that? Recall this industry, we are investing combined for all the projects between 15 to 20 billion US dollars for all the projects and even the offshoot investments. So this period is our peak uh, for contracting. And uh, it is during that time that we are issuing out a number of contracts where Ugandan companies, but also international companies should be keen to ensure they don't miss this opportunity. Uh, we are looking to sink in that amount of FDI. And uh, it is important that uh, you, uh, this, we've structured a number of contracts. We've been issuing out contracts around logistics, civil works, 
but also catering and the rest. So this is the best time for any company that wants to benefit uh, from this industry. Thank you, Ms. Latebe. I will come back to that very shortly. I want to quickly go to um, Joslyn. Joslyn, uh, your, our bridge, some of uh, this heavy technical language in economics and the business world. And I want to refer you to Gibran's presentation. If you could quickly uh, pick out one highlight for us from a business environment perspective or from a private sector perspective, what would that be? Thank you, Alan, and uh, good morning to everyone, all protocol observed. Gibran, your presentation was thought-provoking. To be honest, uh, we would like to see those slides because there was a lot to unpack. But the one thing, um, that I, one message that I heard, which I think for me as a, a private sector player that I think is very important is the importance to grow our domestic market. And on this one, I will just tackle the one key thing around agriculture. From where I'm seated as a manufacturer, one of the things that we have seen is we have seasonality in this market. And that seasonality is very dependent Thank you. The agriculture sector is very important to us because most of our consumers, as we've already heard, 70% of the population is dependent on agriculture. So ultimately, when those um, consumers do not earn, it's a very simple math. You know, immediately you see the industrialists, especially those of us who have a lot of um, dependency on local purchase, immediately have a, a decline. So the agriculture sector, I think, is one that really needs a lot of attention, especially going into the next fiscal year. We need to actually address, and I know some things are beyond what we can do in terms of the climate change aspect, etc. but there is a lot that we need to harness. We're already a food basket for all the areas around us, but I don't think we have actually understood how to take this to the next level. I always think about Zimbabwe and what it looked like way before it went through its own economic challenges and the amount of money they were able to earn internationally, the export revenue. I would like to see Uganda actually you know, approach that in a very systematic way because that has spillover effects for the domestic players. Thank you. Thank you, Joslyn. I want to stay on uh, that domestic production issue. And uh, I will direct my next question to Dr. Mohumza. I've given you this story before. Once I was somewhere with a, a high executive and I was asking him about his business outlook. And he told me that um, his business outlook, if I could give him the weather forecast, he would tell me what his business outlook is. What he was really saying is that he's very dependent on uh, what the farmers do, what the farmers harvest, what the farmers sell. And maybe just sticking to the domestic production piece. Last year we were together after the budget and we spoke about the parish development model. I'm keen to understand, I know you've done some monitoring and evaluation, I'm keen to understand what the progress card looks like. Thank you, Alan, and morning, everybody. Um, I think you raise fundamental issues on the Paris development model. The domestic market, because that's what it's intended to stimulate. We know it is targeting specifically 39% of the subsistence households, and we are deliberately not saying sub agricultural because they are those subsistence who are outside the agricultural sector. The hawkers, you see, and even very many employees look at the data. A lot of Ugandans are earning 90,000 uh, per month, 250 or 200. Literally, that's less than 
uh, dolede, so they are also subsistence in their own right. Now the models challenge is, um, I think, again, the limitation of the government budget and maybe the conceptualization issue. And as an academia on this platform, I will emphasize on that. Uh, that the conceptualization is the Paris development model is seven pillars and all of them are supposed to work together. You find one and not the other, then you are going to have a problem. You are no longer referring to the Paris development model. You are literally referring to a financial inclusion pillar. And glad where you began, I'm one of the guilty ones when it comes to Manchester. <laughs> My place of residence was via the Manchester City Stadium, but I was supporting Manchester United. And football is a game of strategy. You don't tell us about plans. It is the institution, the football club, and the strategy you deploy on the pitch. Change it. Three, four, four, whatever they say. So what was the strategy here? Previously, well, government was giving people inputs via the NADS, which is National Advisory uh, Program. And there were complaints, they were inflated, they were coming in late, and all sorts of things. So government changed the strategy. They let's give the people the money. Then they go and buy for themselves. Now that introduces other challenges. The same government is supposed to make sure there is regulation so that when these people go to buy, they are buying the right seed. You also have got to understand the change in the dynamics because NADS would deliver the planting materials at least at the sub-county and everybody was within a few kilometers of the sub-county. Now, if you have not invested in the private sector, make sure these planting materials are within reach of the farmers, then the farmer may spend part of that money moving to buy rather than actually buying. The other challenge you have is now the agro dealer who provides the inputs. If you have not made sure they are well financed and they are going to use high cost loans and whichever other sources that they are using, they will put on to the same farmer. And then at the end of the day, the farmer will pick less. So concept, if you do not look at all those other boxes, then the Paris development model becomes a case study. We thought we had uh, ticked quite a number of the boxes. But let me speak also to the other pillars briefly. We all have seen the breakdown in the roads. That is pillar number two, economic infrastructure. The roads, the energy, Kifo, DG talked about the climate change, which you have also said, and I think it raises a very important issue that inflation in Uganda literally seems to be more structural. If the harvest is very poor, the prices are going to go up. Now, do we raise the CBR to deal with that problem? And the CBR now will curtail the actual agricultural financing, which is supposed to solve the problem. So when do we balance addressing the symptom and the underlying cause? And the Paris development model was trying to address all those to say, the roads must also be worked on so that these people can actually get the inputs and get their produce out. So if all we are doing is financing the inclusion pillar, which is giving the people money, they are going to be brought down by the other pillars that are not working. Number four was about health services, or is about health services and education. Every child and their parent wants to get access to good education. We have just seen the UNEB results. Some schools don't even have a second grade. They have fourth, third, and fourth grade. Now this parent will actually sell the money coming out of that investment, which was intended to get them out of subsistence farming to take their child to school. So if you don't tick all the boxes to make sure you have the 11 good players on the pitch, you're certainly going to lose goals, you're going to lose points, you're going to get relegated. This is the game of football. So for me, the main thing is about strategy. And it's not about the quantum of the budget. What is the budget driving? And when I look through the details of strategy, I get some kind of blanks. We have had oil, past oil as a moving target. The first one was 2012, 2017, 2022, now 2025. 
and between me and you the pipeline let's face the realities we can debate the facts they like close alan the pipeline is really about 1445 kilometers we have 700 days or there about 2025 are we going to be doing two kilometers of a pipeline per day i will leave you with that fact for discussion thank you certainly very um, a provoking uh, thought or idea now i think it's only fair that uh, miss vatebe the ps directly responds to this very shortly yes uh, and uh, thank you dr muhumza for that observation uh, we do have under our construction management and strategy uh, to ensure that we are able to deploy uh, different contractors. We lotted uh, the, con the construction of the pipeline in two lots so that they are able to work in tandem. So it's not just one contractor running the entire line pipe or pipeline system. So we do have a construction strategy for that. Okay, there you have it. I want to quickly go to the Deputy Governor and maybe let's pivot a bit. On the face of it, Uganda seems to be an island of resilience. I think I've heard that word not less than six or seven times this morning from Gibran, from uh, the permanent secretary. And that's what we see in the macros today. I think it's important to briefly highlight what you think has made us unique. Um, thank you very much, Alan. I think Uganda being resilient is not an accident. Uh, it is something well calculated determination by both the policy makers, supported by the political leadership, because sometimes you can have dedicated technocrats who may not be supported by the political powers. But to the extent that the political powers have given you the freedom to exercise your independence, and of course in an accountable manner, I think to me that's the key. So um, for us, once we began to see that inflation was being stopped by the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, that was sometime in February 2022, we did observe that some components of the CPI, consumer price index, were beginning to rise, but they were not spreading across the basket. So that partly addresses the issue raised by Fred Mohumza, that um, uh, if inflation is structural, what's the role of CBR? I think for us as a central bank, we look at that is this isolated inf inflation, even if it's coming from food prices, is this spreading to the entire basket? the CPI. So the moment we began to see that inflation spreading across the entire basket, we began to tighten monetary policy. And we tightened monetary policy effective June. And uh, by the time when October, we had raised it by 350 basis points. It was something that we deliberately took, notwithstanding resistance, negative comments from, from, uh, from, from the media, the population that why are you touching monetary policy when inflation is structured and what have you? We stayed the course because we knew what we were up to. And indeed today, we are seeing the fruits of this. Sometime in August, we noticed that the exchange was depreciating. So we liaised together with the Minister of Finance to reduce on the releases of um, government expenditure to support us in terms of liquidity management. And indeed, while we delayed on the releases, it helped us to stabilize the exchange rate, and the government assumed those releases um, sometime late September. So that coordination between monetary and fiscal policy and paying the cost, not being diverted by what the, you know, the public is saying, paying the cost and doing what is right, I think has helped us be where we are. And of course, the other issue is 
allowing the markets to do what is needful. For example, the exchange rate. The exchange rate is an equilibrating variable. Once you have shocks, like we had shocks in, uh, in May, June, July, the currency depreciated up to almost 3,900, and we allowed it to go there because that is what was going to equilibrate uh, the, you know, the circumstances in there. So I think um, staying the course, doing what is right, and you know, having a clear objective, being innovative in a wartime situation, using an orthodox uh, tools, right? Deal with the war at hand. I think that's what we did. And I think we are beginning to see uh, the benefits of that. So I think the key lesson here is that do what's right, don't be diverted. And uh, that's where we are today. And indeed, like Jebrin said, Uganda is becoming like an island in terms of investable opportunities. If you look at the peer countries to, you know, to, you know, to Uganda, I think we are, you know, they are beginning to, we are beginning to see inflows back into this economy because we did the right thing. That's what I can say now. Thank you, Deputy Governor. So what I'm hearing from you is light at the end of the tunnel because of policy consistency, that's number one, and policy coordination. Now, I want to stick to that side of inflation and uh, I will go to Jocelyn. Inflation plus all these other disruptive things that we are talking about as forces, potential forces of uh, changing the global order. How would you, and I'm going to borrow your years of consultancy, how would you advise Ugandan businesses to adopt? Um, let me maybe unpack the inflation and how you know, we've seen it play for us, the business side. Obviously, during the um, COVID period, there was a mixed picture. You know, we first saw in 2020 a lot of panic on the global market because a lot of the manufacturers and suppliers who had stocks, you know, and some of the distributors, you know, needed to offload what they had. They, there was a lot of uncertainty around how long this would play out. So initially, at least for my sector, we saw a very interesting trend because we all of a sudden had a bit of dumping, so to speak, in the market. And uh, the first thing that we saw was prices fell to a level that was unprecedented. So of course, we were excited and we didn't know what was coming. Um, so the manufacturers offloaded the stocks, then they stopped producing, right? Because they knew that it wasn't clear when everything would pick up. And then we now shifted into the inflationary pressure, which was more the 2021, 2022. And then we had scarcity as well. I think that played out differently for different markets. You had the chips disappearing, car industry really going through something that they had not gone through before. If you ordered a new car, you were waiting six to eight months. But that also had another positive impact for some of us in the form sector, because all of a sudden, the one sector that was you know, very competitive in taking up polyurethane had now moved away. So then we were still in a good place. But what I would say is, you know, the inflationary pressure for us as manufacturers and, and buyers of input to produce um, has made it very hard, you know, to plan, especially when it comes to pricing, especially in terms of managing cash flow, and so the approach that we've taken, traditionally you can hear tools around hedging and futures and forwards and all these interesting things. Uh, I think in our case, we've taken a, a sort of a watch approach. Uh, we try not to hold on you know, too much on stocks because the prices are all over the place. If you hold, for instance, I, I had visited a, a, a manufacturer, a large manufacturer in North Africa back in 2020, and we drove on a cart, a golf cart on their plant, and they were boasting to me how they had stocks worth one year for manufacturing. Now, you can imagine what I told you. The prices fell dramatically in 2020. I hate to imagine what that actually looked like on cash flow. 
So I think for the players in the business sector, I think it's, it's a question of, you know, looking at historical trends, understanding, you know, what those prices mean in terms of the end consumer price, taking a more, you know, uh, careful approach in how you hold stocks, um, and, and then just really, um, you know, being careful on pricing because, you know, we are not in a place where we can easily pass on those inflationary pressures because the consumer is already suffering with their disposable income. So if you just say, you know, it's going to be a straight line, price went up 20%, price of a mattress will go up 20%, but guess what? Other things are going up as well. And so we, we try to, first of all, take a portion of that pain um, away for the consumer. We try to not hold way too much stock so then you don't have the ability to, you know, be flexible on how you manage um, your cash flow. And then, you know, the, the, the rest is really just a watch. But I, I wanted to um, just talk on something, and maybe you are going to come to it, but I will just take the lead and get in there. Selfishly, as a domestic player, there is something that keeps us up at night. And I can tell you inflation pressures is one, but there's a bigger issue, and an issue that we've lobbied for for a long time. I was talking with uh, Dr. Mahomza earlier, specifically around domestic areas. The Deputy General talked about doing the right thing. If you look at the Ministry of Finance papers that they release, and specifically the table on domestic arrears, if you look at the one that was released in the last financial year, I think that number for goods and services, it grew from about 791 billion to about a billion in the previous financial year. I hate to think what that number is today. Why is all this important? You know, for a domestic player, our cost of capital here is a huge problem. So ultimately, if we have arrears or players with arrears, what it means is their cost of capital has just come compounded. It has exploded. And then when we further look at the most recent paper that is going around um, in terms of what's been budgeted, I think about 2.7 trillion has been confirmed in an internal audit. But we only have government budgeting 200 billion. 200 out of the 2.7, less than 10%. So really what keeps us up at night for the domestic um, private sector players is really around how do we get government to prioritize us, to support us? Because there's a real multiplier impact here. When civil servants are not paid on time, or a supplier or a manufacturer is not paid on time, other suppliers and manufacturers suffer because we have a fairly weak domestic market, a lot of hand-to-mouth you know, situation. So for us, inflation, important, but we have some very serious pressing matters. I think the ask really is prioritization, prioritization to support and protect private sector. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, if I may summarize, I hear from you cash flow conservation. I hear from you proceed with caution. I hear from you um, be, uh, let's try and prioritize uh, payment of domestic areas good enough. I don't think it's too late. Maybe this is extra time. Uh, the budgeting process is ongoing. I take it that that's your one request from uh, the budget when it's read in June. Now, I will quickly, because this is also a very local matter, I will quickly go to Ms. Vatebe on the matter of ESG. Obviously, the, the Uganda Oil and Gas Project has received uh, a significant amount of ESG uh, scrutiny. If you could briefly um, talk us through what the ESG credentials or initiatives of this project are looking like. I think to everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. And uh, I will start by giving the Deputy Governor assurance 
that the banks we are working with are big on aspects of ESG, including Stanbic Bank and others. But also on the operational side, uh, the companies we are working with are among the most compliant when it comes to aspects of environment, social, and governance. But uh, critically, uh, the government has also gone ahead to ensure that we require of these companies to comply certain requirements in terms of the legal and regulatory framework. So when it comes to aspects of the environment, starting with no company will proceed to develop an oil and gas project in this country without having undertaken a comprehensive environmental social impact assessment approved by NEMA, but also well consulted on. So they are required to undertake public hearings where we even invite the non-governmental organizations uh, to ensure we've captured all concerns. That was done for the upstream. It was done for the ECOP, but we are equally preparing to do the same for the oil refinery. So on the legal side, they are required to comply with that. But also I'm aware that the companies are working on a number of biodiversity and conservation programs, working in the communities to plant trees as part of biodiversity restoration. I know UNOC, our national oil company, equally has a program in that regard. So there's quite a lot of effort when it comes to aspects of environment. But also, as government, we've put in place a bespoke oil national contingency plan to handle spills. So in the event, God forbid, that we'd, we have put all the mitigation measures in place, they are known, but in the event of a spill, uh, we do have a clear plan in how we respond uh, to such an occurrence. Now, when it comes to our projects, apart from the legal and regulatory framework, inherently in their design, we ensured that we address issues of the environment. I'll start with the East African crude oil pipeline, uh, where we have minimized its carbon footprint by ensuring buried. So it will be underground and that we are not disturbing the environment. So once it is laid, we cover, and you can continue doing a number of activities within that environ. Uh, but also, uh, when it comes to the upstream, uh, we've been very careful in terms of, for example, how we generate electricity. Uh, we have minimized the carbon footprint to ensure that the bulk of electricity to our upstream facilities will be supplied by the national grid from hydro power uh, with a bit of backup from gas. So we have been very careful inherently to ensure we are minimizing the carbon footprint. Uh, when it comes to the social issues, and here we are looking at social protection, aspects of human rights, uh, we have also gone a long way to ensure we are compliant in that regard. Uh, we do undertake land acquisition for most of our projects. We've concluded the land acquisition largely for the upstream and we're in the process of compensating affected persons for the East Africa crude oil pipeline. But even for these, we are required to undertake comprehensive resettlement action plans that are consultative. And uh, we want to clarify that nowhere within our project areas do we evict any affected persons without first compensating them, or for that matter, resettling them for those who opt for physical relocation. So we've been very careful to ensure we adhere to the human rights and social protection requirements. And um, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, media aspects on the valuation rates, etc. We also want to clarify that we do work with the chief government valuer, but also the district land boards to ensure that all these rates are standardized and uh, are approved by the relevant authorities. So I want to affirm and uh, create confidence uh, that uh, our projects are among the most compliant when it comes to ESG. And we continue to work uh, with the oil companies to ensure that they continue investing in aspects of ESG. 
they have already embedded ESG into their programs. Even on the governance side, we are keen to know uh, through the Petroleum Authority of Uganda, we interact with them on, a, on an ongoing basis to ensure that the governance issues are also being addressed. So if there is any project that has invested enormously in issues ESG, it is the oil and gas project for Uganda. And I'm very sure that's why we continue to retain a number of financials like Afri Exim Bank, but also Standard Bank, because they have done due, dil due diligence on our projects and they have ascertained that we are high in terms of standards when it comes to ESG. Thank you, Ms. Watewe. I see the Deputy Governor nodding. Seems mm. your point has landed home. Good. Um, Fred, I wanted to move away from oil and gas a bit, and maybe, you know, in a very concise manner, away from oil and gas, oil and gas, our two biggest opportunities presented to Ugandan businesses in this new world order, if we may call it that. Well, I think we have um, we seem to have opportunities elsewhere uh, besides oil and gas. And as you said, I wish, and I'm going to really struggle with my uh, Irene Bateve to to move her away from oil and gas. But that means I must first move her bosses away from oil and gas. And we talk some other minerals. 2025 is a good target for gold. Uh, the refineries on gold came in around 2014. Had already spent some time discussing the oil refinery. And for them, they have really increased the export of gold from less than $100 million to $2.2 billion. That's about 40 43, 45% were total export earnings. And you saw what debt is doing for our export revenue. So if we can discuss a conversation on gold, conversation on the other minerals, we can pick faster traction in that direction and be able to beef up the reserves that the DG mentioned have really gone down. So that's an option. We still have space in tourism. And we're not just talking about chasing the gorillas. Tourism is very many things. I don't think people going to Dubai are going for gorillas. And uh, the statistics I read, Dubai says Ugandans are second biggest source of tourists from Saharan Africa going to Dubai after Nigeria. So there are many other things that we can really bring up in those spaces and be able to pick them up. Agriculture is still fundamental, but it's quite really fragile, really. We can say we have food to eat. We lost people in Karamoja the other day. So it's really not as safe as people want to put it. We still have children going to school without food. And we are using wrong policies to say, put by laws, every parent must pay money for a child to eat food. There is no parent who is really worth the name or the title who would want to see their child leave home without food. I used to wrap my food in banana leaves and take it to school. Now, it looks like there is actually no food at home. So this is a food-stressed country. They always say, be conscious about what you ask because you might get it. We really asked for Uganda to be a food basket for the region. We built roads into the region, to South Sudan, into the DRC, the Bondubujo roads, Bondwe crossing border, Kenya. You saw Kenya is our biggest destination of exports. We're ahead of many other countries. What are they buying from here? It is food. So we actually became a food basket for the region, but we do not have the food. So we need to be looking into that area of ramping up production. And here is where our strategy is failing us. Food production, as I've said, is about what seed are you putting in the ground. 
Now some people are saying we need to do a mini irrigation. There is nothing like a mini irrigation. There has never been a small snake. All snakes are as little as they can be. I didn't go to chat GDPT, but I went to the normal Google and found that uh, a maize plant in a very well set drought condition will require a minimum of two liters of water per day. Now you can literally pack about 30 to 40,000 maize plants in a hectare. You're talking about 6,000 liters a day. So what is mean irrigation? Where is that water? Why don't we get back to our scientists and talk about drought tolerant varieties, pest resistant, faster maturing, and the scientists have done this. You read the papers today, they have done Aflatox, Aflasev, the people in Nakia Sasa. They are now waiting for commercial production. The science is done. Now, most people thought aflatoxin is a post-harvest issue. The scientists are saying, no, actually the bacteria attaches two weeks before the maize flowers. So you need to be spraying aflasave at that point in time. So you can see that the strategy is completely wrong. And we won't get out to get sufficient food if we don't address what science is telling us to do. So there are issues with policies and strategies. And what is failing us in some of these things? DG really has been suffering with, I think it is a wrong definition that people imposed on us. There is when we call domestic borrowing, and then European fund managers come and buy our bonds. Now, this, these are not lending to government. So while you are calling it borrowing, for them it is investment. Little wonder whenever the investments are good elsewhere, they begin to exit. I don't think Anne Juko here can lend to Jocelyn, and then when she finds somebody with a better interest rate, that way the money she lends to Jocelyn to another person. So please, let's not call them lenders, because lenders don't change for the duration of the agreed period. These are investors. So DJ has to fight the portfolio investor outflow, whom we are confusing and saying they are also part of the lending. So can we get the definitions right? I come from the academia, and if the definitions are not right, then the whole analysis is going to be floating. How are we defining unemployment? If we come to interview and say, did you work in the last one week? Yes, you are employed. Really? Is that how you're going to get subsistence? Now, the people who are serving on this function, because I imagine Serena may have called a few people. Now, if you interview them this week, you will confirm they are employed. But these are people who may not have had any income for the last six months. So can we get the definitions right in order to begin seeing the opportunities? In order to begin making the right policies? DJ, I want us to have a Doctor, conversation. Dr. Fred, I'm going, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you a bit. This I will have with DJ later. Yes. To do with how we measure <laughs> inflation targeting. Thank you. Our time is fast spent. We are going to use the next 15 minutes trying to wrap up. I want to give an opportunity to any of the panelists. If you have a question for another panelist, this is an opportunity for you. Tibran? Um, yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, and I guess uh, you strategically put me next to my fellow I, I'm hoping Man United fan sitting right here. <laughs> but I yeah, know it's been fascinating to hear a lot of the panelists speak about um, some of their thoughts. Uh, my question is for the DG, um, specifically around the government's internal funding options. Um, you know, uh, currently, are you in discussion for a syndicated loan? Um, and would the government also consider FX swaps to boost reserves, like other African countries have done? Um, so, so what are the dollar funding options apart from the IMF's investments? And if you are in talks for syndicated loans, because I ask this because you know if you don't have ample funding options, then it goes back to domestic borrowing again, and then 
interspace will still remain sticky and elevated. Yes. Um, thank you, Debrin, for that question. So let me begin by saying that our traditional sources of um, balance of payment support fiat write up, these are the concessional loans. Uh, we have funding from the uh, the IMF under the ECF that we have right now. We talked about the $1 billion of three years. But then the other BOP support is really very small. Now, we are in a situation where our reserves low. We had uh, told that we would do net domestic financing of about 5 trillion shillings, 22, 23. But we also realized that because the central bank was raising the policy rate, if we were to go and raise the entire amount from the domestic financial market, then the yields on government securities would shift upwards. And to the extent that supervised financial institutions use these yields for their pricing, they use it as a benchmark, we were concerned that that will lead even to higher lending rates. So the option that government then opted for was to substitute domestic financing for external financing. So that's why you've had two loans being discussed uh, with two financial institutions. And we hope that these loans are going to be con you know, contracted in hard currency. Um, and to the extent that government expenditure largely shilling dominated, we think that when these loans come in FX, um, Bank of Uganda will buy the FX and then give government the shillings, and in that way, we are able to show up our reserves. Now, in terms of determining the grace period for these loans, we are mindful of the debt servicing in the next two, three years. That's why you might have heard that all the commercial debt borrowing is insisting on a government on a grace period of about four to five years, just to make sure that we don't have amortization of these loans within the medium term, because we are already overburdened there. So we think that by spreading, by increasing the grace period, we can push the debt service outside this critical period that we're in. So, uh, government funding position, substituting domestic debt for external financing, in the hope that that's going to shower our reserves going forward. So that's how I can answer your question. Now, going to FX swaps, again, market conditions for such things, you know, we are very, very conservative in, you know, in that area. So we will do what we think works for us. Thank you. That, thanks, Didi. Just a follow-up on the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, the RST financing from the IMF. Uh, Rwanda is the first country in Africa to have uh, received this uh, facility. Um, I, I, I believe, uh, you know, neighboring Kenya has also put their hand up to, to get this RST financing. Uh, is Uganda also interested in this resilient and sustainability trust from the IMF? And, and does uh, Uganda's climate policy sort of fit the bill, be an eligible candidate for this facility? Yes, thank you again, Jabrin, for that. Yes, I'm aware of the resilience and sustainability trust run from the, from the IMF. Just um, last week of January, I was in Kigali. Uh, the IMF managing director was meeting the ESC finance ministers and central bank governors discussing this very thing. So now for you to be able to access that uh, funding, you need to have done what they call a climate diagnostic uh, assessment. And my understanding is that the World Bank is doing that for Uganda because you need to know where your gaps are in terms of this climate, and then you put in, policy, in place policies, and then that's going to support your access of the RST. So we are, we are still in the diagnostic stage of it. So depending on when the World Bank releases those results, then we will certainly consider that in conjunction with the Minister of Finance, of course, but it's something we're thinking about to, to finance our climate and also the resilience. Thank you, DG. All right, I have three more minutes only for any other questions from the panelists to each other. Uh, Ms. Matevi? Yes, mine is to the Deputy Governor. Yes, uh, we just concluded COP27, and there was a lot of discussion around climate financing and a push 
uh, by the Africa, uh, by the developing countries uh, for concessional or even grant financing. But each time we try to access this funding, we don't see tangible and quick financing. What do we need to do to really tap into climate financing? Thank you. Um, yes, I am not going to talk about fiscal policy, how it comes in the budget, but I'm aware that for the financial sector as um, the case. Um, I know that for those financial institutions that are going to pursue certification of sustainability in the operation, they stand to qualify for climate financing at very, very good terms. There is a fund out there, uh, the name has gone off my mind, but that fund is meant to help those financial institutions that have certified uh, that uh, they, are, so they are pursuing sustainable financing. So there's a process that you need to complete, you assess, and then you qualify for those resources. These are highly concessional resources, that are really meant to promote um, environment and social sustainability as well. So that's what I can really speak to from the financial sector. It must have to me that I'm not very what's happening and the fiscal. For the permanent secretary, I think we shall take that as standvik. We do have uh, a number of ideas on what we can do with that. So to quickly, uh, yes, one more, just one more. Okay. Sorry, you're struggling with the mic. Oh, okay. Just a quick question for the permanent secretary, specifically around energy. Um, the industrialists have realized that we are challenged when it comes to the quality of energy. And as a result, we have workarounds. So you typically hear of a lot of use of uh, backup generators in manufacturing processes. And all of this is tied to, you know, the quality of the energy when it comes through the low voltage, the instability of the, um, you know, the distribution that we are getting. But it also talks to a missed opportunity um, in terms of the actual earnings that you could actually recognize, realize because you already have, you know, installed capacity, you're already distributing but one could argue you're not maximizing on the earnings because if we have workarounds on more expensive alternatives today, then you know, there, there is some opportunity there. I guess I wanted to find out from you what, what are the thoughts around for the already installed capacity that is already being transmitted um, in, in terms of you know, dealing with the quality aspect. So of course, there's the cost aspect. We've lobbied significantly for that. Some industrialists have actually seen you know, significant reduction in cost. But in terms of the actual quality of the energy um, that we are utilizing in our factories, what is the thinking around addressing that? Thank you, Joslyn. And uh, thank you for that feedback, especially on the affordability side. Uh, where we sit as the Minister of Energy and Mineral Development, uh, there are two issues that we have prioritized aspects of affordability, but also reliability, which speaks to the quality of power that we are supplying. So we are working with our utility companies, including the private utility companies, Umeme and others who operate in the service territories, especially outside the Umeme footprint. That's West Nile, Padeda Beam, Lembe, but also Chegegua. We have other utility companies beyond Umeme. So we are working with them to ensure that as part of their planning, they are prioritizing investment in work strengthening of that grid. Of course, our national electrification strategy does indicate we do require significant funding to a tune of about 5 billion 
US dollars, first of all, to achieve unif universal access, but also to strengthen and ensure reliability of power supply. So we also work with Minister of Finance. We've been able to close some funding with the World Bank to a tune of about 638 million US dollars that will also go a long way uh, to strengthen our electricity supply. And uh, we are focusing on industrial parks in addition to the households and refugee communities. So on an ongoing basis, we do have strategies to strengthen and ensure grid reliability uh, to our suppliers. So we hope that the industrialists with time can feel that effect of our different plans. Thank you, Ms. Watewe. Now we need to bring this to a close. Um, I will give each of our panelists a minute only to give our participants one word that they should walk away with for 2023. One word. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I think to the extent that the new world order is creating very challenging circumstances, I think we need to ask ourselves, how can we ride on technology to, to, to make our business models very flexible, adaptable, so that as these shocks keep hitting us, we are able to, 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 uh, to, to adapt, to be versatile to them. And this not only applies to policymakers, but even to businesses, to corporates. Flexibility and how do you take advantage of technology going forward? Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Governor. What I hear is technology to adopt. Yes, as part of the new world order, uh, there is an aspect that we didn't discuss exhaustively, and that's the energy transition. So as the Minister of Energy and Mineral Development, we want to emphasize, and Gibran spoke to this, uh, the energy transition should be tailor-made on a case-by-case -case basis for countries. A country such as Uganda, where we are predominantly using biomass uh, for our energy requirements, it is onerous to push us to transit very fast, even before we have accumulated the required financing to support this transition. So oil and gas shall be very important as part of this transition to finance that renewable energy future that we seek for. So we want to emphasize that as part of our transition plan, oil and gas sits at the center of that transition. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watewe. Oil and gas to finance transition. I think I've heard that before. Joseline. So I spoke earlier about the importance of the domestic market, or should I say strengthening the domestic market. And every single player in this market has a role. So for those of us who are in the business sector, um, you know, let us make sure that when we're looking at sourcing products or, you know, supporting other suppliers, what is our, you know, culture around payments, right? Because that particular player also has to make other payments elsewhere. When we look at, um, you know, government, how do we actually make good on the commitments that are outstanding and have been for many years? And then when we look at consumers, when you think about where your spend is going, um, let's give an example on tourism. Before you get on the plane to go to, you know, Mauritius or Seychelles, how much have you actually spent exploring your own country? How much is your own spend on tourism and domestic tourism? I think if we all have a very um, concerted effort on doing our part in supporting each other in the domestic um, economy and consuming products, being responsible, that will go a long way in actually getting us to where we need to get to. Thank you. Thank you, Joslyn. I hear support each other's businesses, collaborate, network. I think it is still too early to say the new world order. It's still a new world disorder. There is still a lot of uncertainty, no order yet. Uh, going forward, I think we need to make sure, uh, as DG said, the chain is as strong as the weakest point. Our households are still very fragile and weak. So we need to make sure government programs like this Paris Development Model work by just making sure all the seven pillars are active. Jocelyn here doesn't produce mattresses for herself. Remember, she, we buy a mattress, possibly one per every five years. 
So she needs very many households buying at least one per year. And those can only be those agricultural households, the laboring households. So until we look back at the households, inclusivity of growth, we are going to continue with the disorder. Thank you, Dr. Muhumuza. Don't leave the households behind, is what I hear. Um, finally, Gibran. Yeah, look, I think from my side, I'll just um, say make agriculture great again. I can't re-emphasize the importance of that. Um, what is a bit, I guess, frustrating is that I've been coming to Uganda for 11 years, and the, th the takeaway from every panel or discussion we have is, is this, boost savings, make agriculture great again, um, instill fiscal discipline, so implementation risk is really high. And I think we live in a really uncertain world, as the doctor said, that, um, you know, anything can happen this year in terms of Taiwan and the U.S. move away from a proxy war. You can see more aggression from Russia towards Ukraine. You can see international oil prices remain elevated for longer. The Fed could be more concerned about inflation and, you know, stay more hawkish and more restrictive in terms of monetary policy. So it's an uncertain world. And in that kind of a scenario, make your domestic economy more robust. And you have to now transition and reset towards agriculture. Thank you, Gibran. I hear insulate ourselves by focusing on domestic production. Thank you all, uh, my dear panelists. A very engaging dis uh, discussion. I think we've barely answered uh, a third of the questions that were coming through. So thank you again to the participants as well. Very engaging in, the term, in terms of the questions that were coming through. Will you join me in uh, thanking this very wonderful panel? A very big thank you to the panel. Um, wow, what a morning. I, I believe we need to give them a standing applause. We, we have the challenge of having stimulating debates and raising a lot of questions. There's still quite a number of questions coming through online, and we will, and within the room as well, the panel will be behind for a couple of minutes to take them directly. And wow, what a morning. Thank you so much for investing almost four hours of your time to be with us. I would like to take this opportunity to invite our chief executive at Stanbeck Uganda to um, have some closing remarks. Welcome, Anne. Thank you. Still morning. Good morning, everyone. Oh, no, I know it's been four hours, but you can do better. Good morning, everyone. I'll start by thanking each and every one of you. Thank you for coming and thank you for staying. Thank you for, for participating in what we hope was a thought-provoking uh, conversation. To our panelists, I join in thanking you for educating us, for feeling us, and helping us to ask the questions that we need to ask. We as Sandbeck continue to do these economic forums for two reasons. One, to educate, to share, to create a stage for these conversations to come to the fore. But perhaps, uh, and more important, is the second part, is to create a conversation after this one. And that is the most important conversation. We've stood here today and we've spoken to you about all tribes of risk, interest rate risk, inflation risk, credit risk, climate risk, and all that. And I bet in your minds you're thinking, so you've told me about the risk. And then what? And then what? What happens after this? That's where I come in, and this is where they give me the hard job, is to say that uh, for every single conversation we've had here, we know that it's going to impact your business differently. We know that none of us is insulated in the new world order. In the old world order, or what my friend Dr. Muhumuza would say, disorder, we knew two things to be certain death and taxes. In the new world order, we can comfortably add risk. There's always going to be one form of risk or the other manifesting in your business, which is where we come in as your risk management partners. That for everything we've spoken about here, there's a whole array of solutions that we could talk about and we could discuss. If we got into that, it becomes a jumbled conversation because each of these risks affect your businesses differently. 
So we prefer to do this on a one-on-one -on -one or a bilateral basis, whether it's your exchange rate risk, your interest rate risk, performance, credit risk, we are there and we are happy to help. That's why we do, that's what we do. Perhaps the most important risk of all that we must all address ourselves to is what my boss, Deputy Governor said, an existential risk of climate, climate change. I am pleased to share with you that we are one of the few institutions in this country that has a fully fledged sustainability department. We are already working on this. And the question that uh, Irene, you asked about green financing, the answer is a resounding yes. We have it within Stanbeck and we are happy to have these conversations with you. The beauty about this thing is that you're not just, it's good for your business now, it's also good for the planet, it's good for your children. You're doing well, you will do well by doing good. So we are open and we are, in fact, one of the things that I've done a lot in the last few weeks has been to share our sustainability embedment journey. So even if it's just to have a conversation to ask Stanvik, how have you gone about it? We are happy to share that with you because there's only so much we can do as a single entity. There's a lot more that we need to do. Gibran, you provoked me when you said you've been here 11 years and every year we say make agriculture great again. And then you come back next year and we say the same thing. I want to answer you. In fact, we've had this answer for the last two years and we continue to answer. This is under our circle proposition or our agriculture financing standard. We have gone out and found a pool of funds. In, it, in the fullness of time, that pool of funds is up to $100 million, which we are lending at, you can quote me on this, we are lending at 10% per annum in Uganda shillings to circles in the grassroots village lending organizations. Because sitting here at Crested Towers, it's very difficult, and with all our branch network, it's difficult to get to the grassroots. We're not set up for it, we don't have the expertise for it. But if we partner with the circles down in the village, so I am funding the circle, the circle is funding the farmer at the closest possible. This is how we start to change the household income. This is how we start to make agriculture great again. This is how we make a difference in the things that we're doing. So again, that's another note I want to invite you on to engage us. If there's a, com do we just want people who are organized in an economic activity, preferably agriculture? Not only are we funding the circles at 10%, we are also digitizing them so we can connect them to the main economic uh, center. But we're not stopping there as well. We are training them. In our minds, these circles can become uh, mini standbacks. Can you imagine at the village level? They can, because we have the technology to do it. You will have seen posters at the back of the room or FlexiPay. Under FlexiPay, at no charge, we are able to help the circle disperse to the farmer. The farmer need not go and walk two or five kilometers to where the circle is. On their cabidity, they can draw down the funding. I'm pleased to report that we have already lent out up to 20 billion across different circles in the country, more than 5,000 circles. But there's so much more that we can do and that we want to do. So I welcome you to an even broader, much more involving conversation after this, so that we can all together move this country that we call home forward. Thank you very much for your time. See you soon. Thank you, Anne. Ladies and gentlemen, um, the conversations continue. Please look out for follow-up conversations on our Twitter spaces. There's a lot of engagement that's come through uh, the various platforms on which we've been engaged in this morning. Thank you so much for your time and looking forward to engaging with you again this week and going forward. Thanks and have a nice day.
It's not enough to just do things the way you used to. Is the hustle and the inconvenience. You call it for less with Flexi Pay. But what is Flexi? FlexiPay is an integrated e-platform that sells from individual and business needs. Posted on UNSSD, mobile app and wave to facilitate financial transactions for banked, multi-banked and unbanked. So, how do you get started on FlexiPay?